Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Wild Wild Weiss, the community podcast for Calgary Weiss Schwartz. I'm today's host, Tim Jensi. Today, we've got some pretty well-known Australians on the show. Our first guest has been playing Weiss at a high level for a long time. Member of Team WCC, recently took top eight in the 2021 online North American Spring Fest and got top eight in offline Spring Fest bets several times in the past five years. You can also find his writing scattered around various blogs online. Our second guest has not made their tournament resume conducive to a 30-second Google search, and really, that's all I was willing to give. But is the author of Make Marika Great Again, and possibly one of the most renowned blog posts on white strategy. Together, they were the commentary team for Dad's Ranch at SBTCG 2012 Legacy Tournament. Welcome Kent Takahata and Philip McKay to Wow Wow Weiss. How are y'all doing? And please stop giggling. <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, i'm just laughing because so um for everyone listening um uh tim sent us through the interview questions uh and i told him that i was fine with it without actually opening it up so i didn't know that he'd like tried to find out what my quote-unquote tournament <laughs> resume is and it's just really funny that we've reached a time when it's easier to find ken's tournament re resume than it is to find mine like I remember, I don't know, Ken, if you remember, probably like five, six years ago, literally every Facebook post that I could find on like the old, uh, like any Australian wise thing was like, I was somewhere on it. And now it's just like, yeah, we don't know who this guy is. He just writes blogs or something. <laughs> just being active pays off. <laughs> I spent 30 seconds. <laughs> do do you want me to do you want me to like uh give you my tournament resume like very briefly so i if don't it makes you like... feel better okay all right it'll make me feel much better um <laughs> i i have not played the game for the last five years which is probably why you can't find anything the last time that i played an event i think was six years ago maybe at like macquarie the first time I played an event was in 2011 when the game came out, when I won the first uh, ever standard event in Japan um, and, uh, and a bunch of standard events. I don't think I've ever won anything serious for Neo standard in, um, in the rest of the world, actually. So I won some, some, some stuff in France, like nationals and oh, things okay. like that. But yeah, like, I mean, unless you're looking at French Google um, in, in the Wayback Machine .fr, you're probably not going to find any of that. To be fair, I, like I was Googling both English and Japanese. I didn't think to Google in French and like <laughs> I'm trilingual. So that's something I guess I should have done. But <laughs> now I know if I'm talking with people, I, yeah, Google France. Google France. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> But yeah, it's nice because all of Ken's stuff is just listed on his Team WCC page. Oh yeah, I'm grateful that they list all the stuff there. I don't need to even need to do it myself. <laughs> it's just a nice Hall of Fame. And yeah, I can just post that as my resume if anyone asks me about my yep. card game. <laughs> Um, Actually, you know what? How can I how can I talk about resume without mentioning that the most important thing of all is that I coached the guy who won worlds twice. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> something I should mention. <laughs> Shout outs to Riaz, by the way, my guy. You did it on you basically did it on your own. But uh yeah, I was there. I was there. Uh back in the beginning teaching old mate how tempo worked and all these concepts, which now I think people take for granted in this game. But uh they were interesting when I was talking about them, I think. Uh, less so now. I think everyone gets that stuff. Oh, okay. So it's like it at the beginning when Weiss was just uh, in the primordial ooze of play heel card turn sideways. People weren't really thinking about that? Yeah, look, I mean, my my experience coming in was from... Like, I played in my first MTG Pro Tour when I was nine years old. So mm. um, it was a very different world coming into coming into Weiss, right? Uh, whereas, I, actually, I have no idea, Ken, what you did beforehand. So, I mean, I pr probably have to pass it over to you. But yeah, when, when I started playing Weiss, I was kind of like, oh, okay, uh, here's um, a bunch of concepts that everyone knows in competitive card games elsewhere that no one seems to recognize in this game. And it was part of the reason that I did well early on. And it was part of the reason that I stopped playing was because... Well, I will, maybe we'll get into that later. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, Ken, I don't actually know where what you played before. 
Um, I played Yu-Gi-Oh as a primary schooler, like a lot of kids did mm. here in Sydney. And uh, yeah, I kind of picked up WS uh, in early high school or middle school, if that's what it's called, where you live, around when uh, I yeah, was yeah. 12 or 13 years old. Um, I wasn't really a serious player back then. I kind of just played once a week or so, but um, I think I just gradually pick, pick things up i wasn't nearly as competitive as i am right now back then obviously but yeah it just kind of came to me through playing the game for long enough and by the time i started going to more tournaments i think i had it okay gotcha, somewhat gotcha. downtown actually i got a quick question because i remember when i used to live in the uk at they weren't a big nintendo place so not a lot of people got into card games via the pokemon tcg and uh, both you guys said magic and Yu-Gi-Oh. is australia also not really a big nintendo place um, I reckon there were Pokemon kids. Uh, it just happened to not really be my school in particular. Because mm. uh, I know uh, my boss's son, I think, said hey, he's just now 13 years old as well. But uh, I think he said that his son was into Pokemon until pretty recently, like a year ago or so. So mm. uh, I think it just happens to be which school or which group that you were with. It. And uh, it just wasn't mine for that point. You mentioned that you got into Weiss in middle school. Uh... Philip, you mentioned that you got into Weiss at the ground floor. What got you into Weiss Schwartz? Like, what hooked you in? Like, especially coming in from, like, playing high, high level magic or playing Yu-Gi-Oh to some degree. Oh, I guess I'll go again. Um, yeah, so for me, I was playing Yu-Gi-Oh at a local card shop, which I'd started, uh, fre- well, not frequenting, just like once a week again, because, um, you know, when you play card games and you have a bit more freedom now that you're not in primary school anymore. You start doing things on your own. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I was also kind of getting into anime at that point, just from, I can't actually remember why, but yeah, I started seeing anime and uh, I saw a bunch of guys playing with uh, cards with characters that I recognized and thought it was kind of cool. So yeah, I kind of started talking to them. Uh, one of them sold them sold me a deck for a pretty reasonable price, given that, you know, I was like a 12 year old that they could have pretty easily ripped off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I started from them and kind of uh, slowly edged my way into that community. Okay. Yeah, so what hooked you in, Philip? What hooked me? My friend, a very close friend of mine, her father was one of the original card designers for Weiss. Um, really? Wow. Who did, who did effects. Uh, one of the only Western people who worked in the Bushy Road office. And she said to me to play this anime game knowing very well that i have a very low tolerance for the animes (laughs) um and i i said okay fine and i played the game and i i really liked the mechanics that was that was pretty much all it was and i i I got the original like disgaea deck which was basically impossible to get in the west and like um some old decapo stuff and Mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't know what this guy was at Decapo. And frankly, I still don't. Um, and and I I played with um, played with her. And then um, uh, look, I, 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 ga- I gave up on the game for a little while after I played a couple of events in Japan. And then my friend in high school, Josh Lee, um, he I can't remember if he saw it pop up again or I saw it pop up again. And I was like, oh, yeah, let's uh, let's play. And I remember I was in I was actually in France at the time. I was talking to him. He was in Australia. I was in France. And I was talking to him over Skype or whatever we used to use back in the day. AOL, I don't know. Um MSN, there you go, MSN Messenger. Anyone remember that? Um Oh yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I was uh, I was like, "Oh, just buy a bunch of boxes of something." I think it was like Symphor Gear that he got, Symphor Gear or Guilty Crown or something like that. And he was like cracking cards open on camera with me. And then like when I got back, we we kicked things off again. So um, yeah, that's pretty much how I got into it. Uh, it, it had nothing to do with, with playing the series. And it's never been that, actually. I've never cared about the series that I'm playing, except for meme value. Um, oh, okay. that, that I care about. But I, I can probably name three series in this entire game that I've actually watched. And what are they? Um... I've watched the Godzilla animation. Oh, wow. That's a great start. Um, I've watched Star Wars. <laughs> Is the last Anime. one Adventure Time by any chance? <laughs> and um, I've watched, uh, no, I've watched Evangelion. Okay. Right. 
I was about to ask, did you ever let the anime into your heart? And the answer seems to be no. No, I, no, no, I really <laughs> didn't. And in fact, when I when I played in Japan, the biggest issue that I would have, because I don't speak Japanese, I don't read Japanese like mm. Ken does, um, is they'd do these sort of like post-match interviews or post-tournament interviews, and they'd ask me like, why did you pick the set or like who's your favorite character and stuff like that and i just kind of go i i don't even know what the cards say on them my guy <laughs> so i was probably the worst person to interview after those uh those events um and even now i mean when i i don't know the names of of, of the vast majority of cards that i've ever played even even the sets that i'm very well known for i don't know the majority of the um the character names <laughs> This is starting to make that Kiz and Ivor video look even more absurd. Oh, you've watched that? Yep. I did my <laughs> research. Wait, what, 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 what about that exactly? It's you like you're off? hyping up this set, and now you're telling me you don't watch this shit? <laughs> I, think, I think I watched the first couple of episodes of it. <laughs> okay. Because it's just like, how can you be like, this is going to be the best, guys, if you don't even give a shit about the show? <laughs> I take care about the show. <laughs> Like and Ken's just sitting here absorbing all of this. <laughs> Ken, Ken knows I have uh, no love for the animes. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of figured. Um, I guess one thing to say about Kisnaver is that they don't go to space. <laughs> oh yeah, That's yeah. I, can say. <laughs> I I think so. Really, in terms of like what I've watched for for anime, because I okay, I have watched anime. I appreciate it as a as an art form, but a lot of the stuff that I've watched is very old i mean like akira uh mm. like legend of the galactic heroes uh that's one that i i don't know some people might not even know that like old like og gundam like like oh, 1970s like double gundam. 1979 yeah. yeah 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 um or, or like samurai champloo uh, are you just reading off my anime list like my <laughs> no, <personal> I... <laughs> one <laughs> it, it sounds like the og anime watcher my anime yeah, yeah, list yeah, yeah. Profile Your anime list. <laughs> I think um Legend of the Galactic Heroes had a pretty recent remake though, so yes, I think that did. one has a bit more um okay, traction than the ones. But but I I do I have watched every bit of Godzilla media that has ever been released. So there you oh, go. Okay. That's that's my uh that's my Japanese interest bubble right there is is Godzilla. Godzilla and an obscure card game. Yeah, yeah. pretty sure. Yeah, we'll take that. And I eat sushi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, you're already doing better than my parents. They watch whatever Godzilla they had at the rental store in the UK, and but they won't touch sushi and they don't play niche card games. So oh, you're more interested yeah. than them. One out of three ain't bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, knowing that you guys got into the game pretty early, was it hard to find people to play with outside of the card shop or even finding card shops? Uh, especially with someone you knew was a like one of the original designers of the game um so in australia i don't know if this game kicked off in uh oh no no, no it, it, it was floating around in in 2011 2012 because we actually have a, a fairly large community of people who are interested in japanese like subcultural um mm. elements especially in sydney it, it is quite large. So it wasn't hard for me to find uh, people to play with when I came back to Australia. When I was in Europe, it was impossible. I mean, it just doesn't exist over there. Um, and it pretty much didn't exist until 2014, I think. Yeah, it was the same thing in, I found in uh, Canada where I was doing my undergrad in 20, oh, sorry, 2012 when I got my Macross Frontier trial deck. So that was the first piece of waste anything I ever had. And uh, yeah, we we were building it at the university club. I think UA was just starting in Vancouver. Yeah, it it only really started getting rolling. Yeah, 2013, 2014. And even then, uh, Weiss Invitationals. Yeah, and we actually like we do get a seat like our invitational seat uh, for Grand Prix. It if you want to just be in nationals you just have to go to rochester and like sorry a third of the seats aren't even filled right well wow. so you get they just do a last chance tournament and most people who i've heard that most people who could go if you have a pulse you'll get in 
That's wild. Because in Australia, we pretty much didn't have tournaments. Uh, well, we had like, in for English, we yeah, also like English, 20, yeah, yeah. Well, for English, we have well within Australia, we have one tournament per season. Well, this is pre uh, pre pandemic times, but uh, yeah, we would have Spring Fest in Sydney and uh, BCS in Melbourne generally. So it is a lot more scarce than I'd say uh, North America, especially in the US, where you don't have to you know leave the country. Although the distance is quite a bit. Uh, same with Europe. You well, you do have to leave your country, but it's still within the EU. Mm-hmm. But yeah, especially for uh, BCS, which is the only tournament where you'd get to go to Worlds, except for that one year. Oh yeah, you'd have to travel quite a bit, and then if you know if you miss that one chance, you have to consider going to New Zealand, which honestly isn't that bad. But uh, given what the stakes are and how large the tournament is, it doesn't exactly feel great to spend all that money going there. And you can go to the Philippines, but I don't actually know anyone who went to the Philippines to play white shorts. I know a, a couple of people who went there for Vanguard. So yeah, then not as much tournaments as I know there are in North America. Yeah, because like I know even in Canada, we have we get usually get two Spring Fest. We'll get one in Vancouver, one in Toronto. But uh, I have some questions. You somewhat dismissively refer, referred to that one time. Can you elaborate on that? Oh, you're already <laughs> laughing. <laughs> This is all yours, Ken. Wait, sorry, which, which one time? Oh, the, the time where you could go to Worlds through Springfest. Uh, oh, I no, thought you were yeah. you talking about the, uh, the event that was supposed to happen but didn't happen. Oh, uh, well, I can talk about that one as well. But uh, for starters, clear up the Springfest one. Uh, maybe it wasn't called Springfest, but I think in 20, either 17 or 18, uh, there was a time where they just made BCS all year round and uh, you could qualify for uh, Worlds either for the first. Uh, uh, either in the first or second half of the year. So that was that. Um, nothing particularly important there. Um, but yeah, like going into that Japanese tournaments thing, uh, competitive Japanese events, or at least ones that let you go to uh, WGP Worlds in Japan, uh, have not been around since 2016. 2016 is the last one, I believe, yeah. Um, because uh, supposedly our distributor wasn't getting the sales that Wish Road would have liked. And, you know, understandable, okay. that stuff happens and we don't get the invite anymore. But uh, for 2019 Worlds, uh, well, when Japanese Nationals was happening and they were deciding who the second player was who gets to go to Worlds, you know, they do their game. It was pretty intense. Stuff happened. You can find the archive on YouTube. But after the game, you know, the third place guy was looking pretty disappointed. And then the commentator just says, oh, yeah, we got some news that the Australian commentator, uh, sorry, the Australian representative is absent. And so we're going to let uh, the third place player from Japan take his spot. And, you know, watching that, I was pretty puzzled because I'd never any heard, uh, I've never heard any news of us getting a WGP at that point. So I kind of went into the chat and typed, hey, what's what's this about? Australia didn't have a, Australia didn't even have a qualifying tournament. How can you be absent? And so Bushiro gives us an announcement saying, oh yeah, there was a miscommunication between us and the distributor in Australia saying that, uh, you know, they didn't hold a tournament, but uh, they, we didn't really know about that. So yeah, we're gonna continue with our decision. The third place guy keeps gets to go, but basically everyone in Australia was kind of uh, a bit up in arms, really, <laughs> and said, "Well, what what's going on? Like, why did no one hear about this tournament being organized, and why didn't we get it?" <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of stuff happened after that, but it turned out that we were missing out on a tournament that we were granted. So, like, was the district distributor even properly notified, or? <laughs> uh. Well, we got an exclamation from the distributor saying something about how um, people were buying their product from uh, other countries instead of through the uh, distributor we have in Australia, which I guess is a pretty big problem. But uh, from the way that it was worded, it does sound like that the distributor did know what was happening and uh, the miscommunication was from them towards Bush Road and not the other way. Oh, okay. Because like, sometimes when dealing with Japanese companies or and uh or even just some parts of the japanese government uh i wouldn't be surprised if the guy just got an email entirely in japanese and just like oh okay yeah uh, english i have no doubt pretty... it was a fault of the distributor like i i, I mean i personally know the guy is there and i have no doubt <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't playing um weiss when this happened if i'd known there were actually 
um, I probably would have come back to the game uh, to play uh, if I had known that there was a like a, a straight road to Worlds. Um, I didn't know. I would have known. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's no way that that was a, a bushy roadside issue. <laughs> it's 100% oh, okay. it was an Australian side problem. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> Sorry, that was our experience for worlds in the past uh, four or five years. But aside from that, uh, Japanese tournaments there is a f- fairly big locals every week at uh, a store in Central Sydney. And well, uh, yeah, again, pre-pandemic times, we did have um, an, a large unofficial tournament uh, run by a uni club, which usually gathered around somewhere between like fifty and sixty players usually. Oh, wow. And uh, it was pretty generous on entry fee and prizes and stuff. So uh, it wasn't hard to find tournaments, just not official ones for Japanese. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, that's actually kind of mind blowing that, like, for locals and weeklies, you'd get like 50, 60 odd people because, like, uh, Calgary, uh, we're considered to have a pretty decent sized community at 20. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, our weeklies are like, yeah, sorry, our, our weeklies are at least now, na- um, just like, in 2020, 20, uh, 2021, I think around 20, maybe uh, 2025 was probably the rough turnout. But there was a brief spike just before uh, restrictions started in uh, March 2020, where I think the store had to cut off people coming, uh, joining the tournament at like 40 something people. So I don't know how much our community was stunted by all of these things. But yeah, the general weekly turnout isn't like that huge. It's just the uh, the tri monthly event that mm. the uni the uni club organizes. Gotcha, gotcha. It is a pretty strong community, regardless, though. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the things that uh, currently, because a lot of the people in our uh, community group for Y Schwartz and Calgary here are like um, mid to late twenties, so a lot of us are out of uni age, and uh, that's definitely one of the hard things is uh, connecting with uh, like the university anime club, that sort of stuff, and just getting these big events off the ground because definitely especially in north america there is this view that older guy coming back is uh rob schneider asking how do the kids do (laughs) oh boy that's definitely a challenge (laughs) well i don't know exactly what the um the organization of uh, said uni club is like, but the first guy who started doing these tournaments has already graduated. Uh, he's still very much part of the community, but um, he kind of just passed the baton to the next guy who's still in uni. But I think, yeah, they are sort of figuring out uh, how they would want to keep it running after he mm. graduates and stuff. So uh, that's certainly going to be a future issue. But uh, yeah, for the moment, uh, I think that community is still somewhat there even without uh the current head of the club so hopefully it does fine yeah no i'm hoping for you guys too uh if you guys had to pick one tournament out of the many that you guys have played what's your favorite overall experience and why oh, I've been talking first, Ken. oh sure <laughs> this is um... why you read the questions beforehand <laughs> oh that's a hard one though actually it's hard to rate tournament experiences but uh, well, I guess yeah. I'll you. I'll, I'll say the ones, n- not any one particular single particular one, but the uni club run ones. Uh, I'm going to just call them Salt Fest because that's what they're called yeah. from here on. Yeah, I think just going to Salt Fest has generally been a pretty positive experience for me. Uh, it's designed to be more beginner friendly and stuff, so each round is some a bit longer. There's a big lunch break in the middle. Uh, we often don't do top cut. We just kind of go there, uh, play our games, and grab our prizes and go. It's more of just a way to give people a place to play and getting to know people. So I really like that atmosphere, actually. Uh, If I would say overall, I'll I'll probably go for Salt Fest. Uh, For official tournaments, though, I would pick uh, just any of the Spring Fests. Uh, I like playing in teams more than individuals for this game, I guess. Uh, It does somewhat mitigate the RNG factor, in my opinion, because I generally team with people who I'm happy to team with. I thought you were going to say you team with people who have better luck than you do. (laughs) No, no. Uh, You know, luck is just a thing of the day, so uh, I just team with people who, if I lose with, I wouldn't be too too annoyed about. So yeah, I I think I prefer teams, but if I had to pick just overall, I'd go with the Salt Fest. Oh, that's really cool. (laughs) 
Um, okay. Does it have to be Weiss? <laughs> no, I mean, to be I honest, I... it to be Weiss. Yeah, 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 yeah. I Weiss know, podcast. I know. Look, uh, yeah, Weiss podcast. I should talk about Weiss, right? Look, um, I think... I haven't actually played in a lot of official Weiss events, to be to be honest. The pro, I mean, yeah, the standard stuff that I played it in in like 2011, uh, obviously being like the only Westerner in a room um, in Tokyo with like 180 people and 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 clean sweeping those was pretty decent. Um, I, I'd actually probably no no, no that's. No, definitely the one that I'm. Uh, I think most people know of slash people have heard of is probably the series of tournaments where I played Puyo, um, and I went XO for like seven or eight events in a row. Um, I, some of those were official, some of those weren't official. I think my win rate at the end of it was like something like like forty two to zero. Um, Damn. Some ridiculous run that I had for a while. So probably that. That would be it. That was a pretty uh pretty good. There's a particular one which like I won't go into details on because some there were some some sketchy things happened and I and I made a big deal about it. Um, there's a particular one where I I went eleven zero over the course of the day, um, and the odds were very much stacked against me. Uh, not because of the uh, um, because of games or matchups, because of uh, uh the way that the event was actually run. Um. Uh, and uh, I still managed to win. Uh, it got to a point. It was a funny thing where we got into top eight, and uh, it was a cash cash event or a cash plus prize event, I think. Um, huh. And the top eight, well, all the other seven people in the top eight, all were all mates with each other. I didn't really know any of them, and oh, um, they all agreed to split prizes except for me. And they pressured me for about half an hour to split prizes, and then I exoed the top cut and uh i didn't look back from there and uh <laughs> dude man all all is nuts right all was insane and and i i i, I will live and die by what i said at the time about how good puyo was and uh um shout outs to alex little andre who now has my uh my puyo cards um signed by me for some reason uh, you're a legend just huge props bro <laughs> If I got my local Puyo player to send you some cards, would you sign them? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, fantastic. He's going to be listening to this, so uh, <laughs> let him know. But I'm not going to pay his postage. Oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll pay his postage. Oh, damn. The <laughs> Philip McKay paying for international letter mail. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Do, do, more do, than do they know who I am? Yes. Oh, They're okay. The person right. who asked me to ask you guys on the show. Oh, okay. okay. Imagine well, your I friend mean... just like sending your deck off and then coming back with it like a month later and saying, here's your cards, but they all have these funny squiggles on them. You don't even know who the squiggles are from. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, Puyo is interesting. I One thing that I can say about this game, uh, which I can't necessarily say for other games that I've played, um, is that there are so many people who, because of the nature of it's it's modular, right? Like you you mm. pick a set and you play it. There have been so many more instances where I've created decks in other games where people on the teams that I was, you know, managing or coaching for or whatever, go went on to you know win win worlds in some cases, um, uh, whether it be in you know MTG or or Pokemon or whatever it is. Um, and I never would have that kickback of someone being like, oh, hey, you're the guy who, who like developed this archetype or something. That's, that's cool. Whereas in this game, it has probably happened, I'd say, a, a couple dozen times where people have kicked back to me and said something along the lines of, you know, you're the person who made me want to play this archetype, um, sign this card or just like tell me something or like tell me a story uh, even years later i mean even when we were commentating on the um the legacy event there was some someone in the chat who said uh, that they took my deck list to like a wgp win or something along those lines and they had no idea who i was in the in the they'd never seen my face before but when i started talking they went oh this is this is him and that's one thing that's really great about this game is that you get very niche community events that occur because of the nature of the game that i've never seen anywhere else i think that's honestly fantastic it's part of the reason that i kind of float around even though i don't really play anymore gotcha gotcha and 
it really it Weiss does have such an interesting it's a niche community and i i think that's definitely why like there's a lot of uh community work to build these tournaments that we do and just the weird shit that we sometimes do and i love it it's a bit of a shame that kind of jp weiss and english weiss are kind of their own islands a bit no i i absolutely agree with you it's uh that that niche oh i know you did this part of weiss is fantastic and it's actually kind of incredible and i'm sure both you guys both kind of have a shit posty sense of humor so you've probably had articles you've written come back that you've forgotten about and people are like you're that asshole who wrote this you know yeah yeah uh that that was my um uh oh boy so when i when i did um make marika great which was i mean you know for, for some people may may not may not understand it um that that was a it was a bit of a character that i was using uh, and it was a character that i had used for a, an mtg blog that i've written i'd written before some of the stuff that um and like ua and i used to be at each other's throats obviously we're we're, we're, we're mates now um but back then we used to have a crack at each other all the time mm. it was a pretty regular occurrence actually that you'd write something and people would just absolutely lose their minds at some of the things that you would say when you were um, blogging. And like, obviously I exacerbated that because it's good for views, right? I mean, it's oh, good for page, yeah. like, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, well, whatever, like, you, yeah, 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 yeah. Like people click on the, click on the page and they click back on the page and um, it's good for your statistics. The one thing that was always in the back of my mind with Weiss in particular. And this kind of goes to like sort of when I was working with Riaz when he started playing the game and turning him into, or well, giving him the fundamentals that he then turned into the player that he is now. It, it was, there were times when I talk about or like what I would blog post about were things that were just, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really, I probably I could have, I could have, I could have done this better. There were things that I was talking about that were just way beyond the level of the game where it was at the time. Um, I mean, I was talking about like virtual card advantage in a time when I think, you know, Patrick Chapin had probably written about it in like 20 or maybe 2008 or something, whenever he wrote his book, by the way, Patrick Chapin, uh, uh, the, you know, MTG guy, great books, not so good person, caught for cheating, et cetera. But I'm talking about him from in the academic sense. Um, uh, he, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, he, he, he wrote about these like very complex ideas that even for magic are very complicated. And then I'd try to bring them into Weiss. And sometimes, and I understand now, maybe when I was younger, I didn't. I understand that that causes backlash when you say to people, well, no, this is not a waifu card game. Like I wanted to take it really seriously. I, I <clears> saw <throat> it as a, as a big a big card game and I wanted it to be up there. Um, I thought it was much better than Vanguard. I thought Buddy Fight was an absolute joke. So I wanted wanted to see this as the Bushy Red card game. And I thought it was a genuinely competitive card game because the same people kept winning. Um, and I really wanted to push back against that, that sort of waifu um, idea of like, oh, yeah, you know, I play uh, insert, I don't know, like what's the worst set you can think of, right? Like my Hime, okay? I don't know, Black Rock Shooter. Um, I play this and I only play this and I think it's the best because I love this set. And I hated that. Um, hmm. And I probably could have been more tolerant of those people. Uh, I definitely wasn't. I, I had no no time to waste for people who weren't in here, you know, talking about applied statistics and um, uh, and figuring out like finishing charts from, you know, all these different uh, kill levels and like how to figure yeah. out that certain things are good, but yeah, et cetera. You, you get the point. Yeah. I remember one of my first blogging experiences was I kicked the hornet's nest by doing a statistical test to show that uh, the white sets that came out had just all of a sudden mostly become waifu, sorry, idol sets. And uh, that started a, I, so I just did a fucking chi squared test, right? So mm. it's very basic statistics. Yeah. And it was basically just, Okay, here's what was being released in 2012. Here's what's being released now. If we had stayed at the same pace in 2012, we would have had less sets that are kind of music idol and more sets that are just straight fantasy, right? And yeah. people lost their fucking mind. <laughs> just, I don't know what your taste is like, Ken, but that's uh, a... Um, no, I, I, I somewhat enjoy idol sets. I have a 
I've played a few. Oh, I do too. Bit. I didn't mean to disparage anyone. But I don't even took think it as such. That's it's not even a surprise because uh, with Idol Master having taken off in around 2011 with the success of the anime, it's not exactly surprising that more series where they try to kind of do uh, an anime with the voice actresses doing performances on stage that just mm. kind of became more popular with Love Live, uh, Wake Up Girls, uh, a few other. Yeah, like I can't do Bang Dream, dream that sort yeah, of stuff. I can't do Bang Dream. Yeah, I definitely stuff. know what you guys are talking about. It just, it just picked up, and the way it, you know, it's natural that they came into the game. So I don't even think that should be a surprise or even offensive. It's like, no, it's just a fact. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, it was so funny because, like, and then like a year later, I'd forgotten I'd done this, and then someone from another city had come down to play uh, one of our shop events. And he mentioned, oh, yeah, and then some guy scientifically proved that voice is just idols. I'm like, oh, that was me. Please don't say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just did some r- rinky dig stats. But, but you know, this this was the thing. Um, when I was doing Make Marika Great, so the guy I was working with, um, Steven, he, he, he's, he's in, like an actual genius. Okay, like this guy's a, a Google software engineer. Mm. Um, and uh, we're very, very close friends. Um, he actually has moved over to Sydney now and, um, uh, we, obviously we're still friends years later. I mean, he, when we were looking at these, um, finishing tables that, that I wrote, which was like, that's kind of like the post, right? That's the one oh, yeah. that people know, um, is when I, and people all, people kind of viewed it as, um, it was my kaleidoscope vanity project, uh, which it wasn't all right because i didn't then go on to take kaleidoscope to tournaments i played puyo i played to lovery right which were you know the two best decks at all to lovery definitely was puyo depends who you asked um and people saw that as like a, a vanity project and like but some people thought like we'd smooth the numbers over and stuff like that no 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 the, what had happened was a guy who went on to now become a very high level software engineer at google was using neural networks to figure out card games Right, like oh, this is the man. level that we were operating on. <laughs> right, it was it was some serious stuff, and I, I'm, I, I mean, I I don't have the mathematical or computing understanding that he has, um, but uh, I'm no slouch myself, and mm. we wanted to we wanted to put out something that was digestible um, and easy to understand, but had a significant amount of information behind. It. And at the time when we did that, it did, that sort of thing didn't exist. Right, right. It, it just did not exist at all. Um, and it was, it was jarring. Um, and I, I don't think it, it changed the game per se. Like I, I, I definitely don't want to claim that putting that sort of article out forced people to change their mind. Um, but it, I think it, it definitely sat in the back of a lot of people's minds that, oh, you know, someone has actually gone out there and proven like, why is Nisekoi actually good? Like, why is this card actually good in this game? Like, what's the maths behind it? Because on the fly, um, there are very few people in the world who can calculate those numbers in their head um, accurately mm. uh, to, to even any degree of, of accuracy. So uh, for someone to then come out and say, okay, here's an actual tangible um, bit of information, like some data, and not just raw data, data that's been processed and we've come to a conclusion mm-hmm. with it, um, it, it was was very different for the time. And there were decks that people were saying, oh, this is, you know, this is a good way to finish the game. This is a good way to finish the game, rah, 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 rah. Like, why was... Why was Marika actually banned? And that was this was part of the the reason of the the meme of the name was like make Marika great again is because we showed that it, it was a very very good um, finisher for sure, but it wasn't the best, and it wasn't even top five um, at the time um, compared to what other things we could do, uh, which was sort of I wanted to see ban lists come out that were actually not just based on results, but actually based on what are the problem cards? You know, the way mm. that nerfs and buffs are made in video games and whatnot it is it's based on problem cards. It's not necessarily just based on tournament results. And I wasn't seeing that. And that was why MMG started. And um, uh, obviously it never had any effect whatsoever because J- Japan- we still do result bans. Yeah, yeah. Japan still does bans based on results, right? And, um, you know, the the dream is obviously for me to get Kaleidoscope banned. Um, and I, given the opportunity, I will do it. You know, if if I see the pathway there that I can, you know, get Kaleidoscope banned, then I'll absolutely do it because I think it's ridiculous mm-hmm. um, the way that some some of the competitive elements outside of the control of the players yeah. uh, are are run by Bushiro. I am glad that you said it was neural network stuff. 
because I always had a sneaking suspicion it was at least Monte Carlo. I don't know how any of these things you have to ask Dave and not yeah. me, man. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, it just it gets so like the thing with Weiss is like the math gets so complex because yes. it's so it's so completely conditional. Like I think I rigged up a Monte Carlo sim for Weiss once, and it's just like, yeah, fuck this. And keep in mind, this was two kids who at the time I think we were sixteen or something, pretty much doing this out of, out of our home. So. Yeah. Like this was some serious maths coming out from from Stephen in particular. I mean, I I I, I processed it afterwards, but um, he he did the raw stuff. Like, mm. yeah, the guy's a genius, and and you know, forever that contribution will be his more so than mine. Um, and uh, it, it was an exceptionally important thing, I think, at the time. And you know, it's interesting. For example, like, we we were you playing back then? This would be twenty sixteen. So. I uh, I think it was before, wasn't it? Was it before that? Well, uh, maybe maybe it was. was Love Rue. It should be before that. To Love Rue was around okay, the 2014 stats. I think, set, so okay. I think, I think it's 2013, 2014. 14. 2014, like, 15 round. I left, I played a bit during my undergrad. So that would have been up to 2014. Then I left when I started working for a central bank. And then uh, did my master's degree. And then I picked it up again when I decided that I didn't want to do real work and went and did fun work instead. Right. So basically the point I'm getting at is you didn't read that article when it came out. No. Well, what's funny no. is I saw that article later when you must have written something that rattled people's cages where I was work where I was playing because they were bringing it up and still like arguing the point behind the article. And then I remember being, it's like, okay, people are really mad about this. What is this? And I read it. It's like, oh, this is just applied statistics. Yeah, so I mean, but th th this is this is what I always wanted to happen with that more than to rattle the cage is that people who didn't read the article when it came out have still read it uh, five years later, even though it has nothing to do with the decks that exist right now. People have still read that, um, and people who've started playing the game two years ago have read that article. Um, and I still have. I mean, the article is still up. Um, it's outdated, uh, but I still have the statistics from it, and I can tell you that there have been almost 300,000 clicks on that article. Just, it's absolutely insane how many people have actually viewed it, um, which is, you know, again, it was the point of it. it we, wanted to, we wanted to write something that, that made people think about how the game could actually be rather than how it actually is. And, you know, I, I, think, I think we can say that we did that. And, you know, that, that's, that's enough for us. Yeah, well, it's like at 300,000 views, assuming people and people definitely clicked on multiple times but it's taking something liberal average three clicks you've probably got everyone who plays english weiss or within some epsilon neighborhood so like very small number neighborhood you probably got everyone who plays competitive weiss ever has clicked on that article maybe uh look if, but you could be right i have no idea um there's know, not I, many of us yeah, look, it's it, it was definitely an article that it did really well, and um, there was a point to it. And uh, uh, yeah, look, we, we we were definitely proud of it at the time, and I'm still proud of it now. And it's still something that um, when people talk to me about Weiss and they ask me, so you're like, what are the things that you that you're really happy about that you achieved? I always tend to point back to some of the things that I wrote, um, in particular that article, to just say he was a bit of a legacy that it still has an effect today. And I mean, I could redo it. Uh, I won't. Um, but it, 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 it sort of proved the point at the time. And, you know, I could talk about the modern game for hours and how how I think you, the errors that I think people are making um, with how they're playing and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that, like, I mean, that's a very, it's a very complex discussion. And potentially, again, you know, if you want to get people mad, then I yeah. don't want to... That is a discussion I want to have, to be honest, because like one of the things that I'm definitely wondering is you got like you, between 2011 and when I started the first time and even 2016, when I came back to the game, the game gra changed a lot. And where was that moment that both of you guys noticed that, OK, this is something completely different? I can literally give you the exact set. I don't know about Ken, but there is an exact set that I have in my mind. What is it? Well, I think uh, it's better if you start then. <laughs> Okay, girlfriend beta, girlfriend really? beta. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
Go from Vader is the exact moment when the game changed. Sorry, go. What was that, Ken? I actually think it's that set as well. Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. if, I, if I were to point to one set, I think it's that. Um, but I, I guess that's a bit more gradual for me. But if I were to pick one set, yeah, that's a that's a we definitely very big. We weren't allowed to play Girlfriend Beta in North America. Oh, uh, I remember this. Yeah, that's so, true. I'm going to need you guys to explain this because I have literally, I think I have seen the girlfriend beta cards once because uh, one of the guys at locals bought it, played it once. I didn't get to play them that week, and then uh, he never brought it out again. Oh man! Uh... So you're going to need to explain. You're going to need to back this up, full view, explain why you guys agree it's girlfriend beta to North American listeners because we never got this fresh hell. Okay. So this is so if I uh, man Ken is going to remember this better than I did. Um so Girlfriend Beta 1 and Girlfriend Beta 2 came out very there was a very very short period of time between the two of them. Mm. Um I I honestly I don't know how long it was Ken do you do you know? I don't know, yeah. Uh, well, I just took a look it's then nine releases apart so yeah it would be about a year oh, at shit. least. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah and and volume volume one when it came out was it, okay it, it was the time when um the game went from you know some sets had certain things and other sets had certain things and if you wanted to play your archetype then you had to have you had to suffer the fact that you you were limited by the archetype that you were playing right yeah um girlfriend beta did not have that girlfriend beta had literally everything in it right it had um an incredible finisher and like when the second set came out it just became even better um it had heals it had a ridiculous consistency i don't remember exactly what the the search combo was i remember the the volume two search combo which was like a um just just insane um the they had a a, a a deck free fresh or you could shuffle your opponent's deck, you could shuffle your deck, you could, you know, I don't know, you could just do everything in it, right? And it was the oh. time when just, I, I think sets changed from being, um, from being different and they became very, very samey, you know? A bunch of sets came out after that. Talavru was very, very similar. The new Fate set ended up being very similar. Monogatari, after it got a buff, came out being very similar. Where they all just had level one combo, um, like a level one oversize, brainstorms. I actually have like a Word document. And Is this I made the a video bingo chart? Uh, yeah, it's like the, the Comic Sans, like how to, how to build a deck properly. Um, mm. And it's like for brainstorm, for clock search, uh, for over, like utility slash runner, um, uh, for flex slots, um, level one combo, level one oversize, uh, level one counters, uh, level two flex slot, um, level two change combo if necessary, level three early play, level three finisher, eight climaxes. Um, and Girlfriend Better was really the first set. It was a set that typified that. Yeah. It, it became a, um, it, it was ridiculously overpowered for how consistent it was um it was i thought the artwork was horrible <laughs> um, and that's something that that ticks me off just about some of these games i oh, thought all the cards looked exactly the same so i couldn't tell the difference the between the artist definitely suffers from same face syndrome i mean and that's even like harder a PS4 for someone game who... it's a mobile game i think it oh, was fun. on okay that explains the same face guys Three? yeah we're talking about like iphone 6 games here <laughs> yeah it, it, it's a game you could play on browser so okay yeah, and, yeah. you know br browser in 2014 was not what we had right now so no uh, it was definitely yeah, a lot it, weaker it was just such a samey set i, I really uh, i remember looking at it as the releases were coming out and going oh there's a um like even just the first set um it, it was like oh yeah we get a um, level level one, like I don't, I can't remember if it was a yellow combo or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't like that. think the first set was as popular or powerful. Um, it was still somewhat restricted by uh, color, which is what the set did in terms of what you yeah. were saying earlier. But uh, the second set definitely kind of just gave blue or everything that needed um, in the one color. And then we said, well, blue doesn't have particularly strong triggers and it doesn't have a strong finisher, so we're going to give it this. Uh, level support, which bonds into a red uh, a red level three heal, which burns on reverse, which means that you can put in the some pumpkin. red. Uh, you, yeah, the pumpkin. 
Yeah. Uh, then you just put in four doors. Uh, and then you put in like four copies of the level zero bomb, which uh, has on uh, on death base you salvage. That was like most of what you needed to do because blue had everything else you needed. Uh, you had the decompressor. You had a level one combo, which was big on defense. Uh, you had the hero clone. Um, you can early play it, and at the beginning of your opponent's draw phase, you can tack four K onto something in your front row. Oh it kind of just God. had everything. Uh, it also had an anti change counter, which was relatively rare at the time, and. Mm -hmm. Because um, it sent the character to stock as opposed to waiting room, it was pretty decent at getting rid of fields because it prevented your opponent from paying three to encore. So yeah. uh, if your opponent ran into it, you would actually just um, you know, completely eliminate the character from coming back that turn, and your field position would be pretty much guaranteed for a cycle. Which I just hated that set. Man. <sighs> well, it sounds so very kind of unbalanced because it just has so many toys. And it's funny because, like, in 2020, what, like, we have, like, sets like Data, Data Live or Adventure Time or pretty much any Grisaia or anything that comes out nowadays, it has all that shit caked in even in the first set. So, like, yeah, I agree with you. It's like, if Girlfriend Beta was, like, the, the first, it was definitely the harbinger of what was to come. Sorry, is Adventure Time a set in this yes. game? Yes. Oh, my God. It, it's Adventure Time is an English exclusive. Sorry, English original oh. title. God. I, I've heard about Data Live. Um, yeah, I, I did hear about Data Live as well, and I my friend sent me the um, the red the red finisher. Um, yeah, and it just kind of like showed me just sort of sort of the core like the core effects and like how how cards are written nowadays and and what the power level I I is like. And I remember just looking through what was going on and just saying, "God, this is so boring." Just there's just nothing interesting happening um, in terms of like cool, interesting effects that are going on uh, that uh, that that make the sets unique and and uh, and different. And I just I really wish there was a time um, when every set pretty much had this core mechanic that was just completely out there. I mean, I mean, just totally wild. Um, whether it's I don't know. Devil Survivor pops into my head right now. Of the like, you you need to put twelve or eleven or twelve markers underneath one card, and then it summons your finisher, which isn't even that good. Um, uh, you know, just weird stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Or Excel like World. Yeah. Or Lucky Star, where you're throwing climaxes out, like discarded climaxes to do shit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that used to be how how the card design was done, and and I really that was what actually life. drew me in. <laughs> It's the trimodal Sorry? effects that are the trimodal effects in Data Live are meant to be like yeah the flavor of the set. Uh, but I, I do agree some flavor. Uh, I don't think decks have like a core mechanic as much anymore, but it's also somewhat inevitable. I mean, they haven't added any uh, new rules to the game since the beginning, so I don't think you can really blame Bush Road for not being able to put in uh like a core mechanic in every set but i do agree that data live is kind of a it's, it's a bore it's a boring and you know not very nice uh way of designing cards see yeah. like i in my perspective on this um i worked very briefly as a card designer um uh, for uh, a company that makes a very very well-known card game um and uh <laughs> one of the problems that that I that I had when I was working for them was that my designs that I would co come up with would be taken to my supervisor, and then um, they. I'm gonna I'm gonna use non gendered words here because otherwise there's gonna be people who know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, and they would look at the cards that I that I designed, and they would say this needs to be just pushed in terms of power level or brought back. Like these are the cards that we want to be good, and these are the cards that we don't want to be good. And I, when I was playing Weiss, I, I designed entire sets um, more than once. I made a whole uh, set full based on Full Metal Alchemist, uh, and it was like it was like a three hundred card set. It was massive because that's the sort of Jesus. size of sets that I was used to designing. Um, uh, or that that really gives it away. But anyway, um, but yeah, so I, I was designing these massive sets for cards, and I could come up with really interesting stuff just on my own. So I, I. I Personally, I, I definitely hold um, like Bushy Road accountable for failing to to keep the game interesting. When I mean, go back and look at Kanan, 
right? Like, which is an old as hell set that I I find one other person in the world who owns these cards. Um, where you have, or oh, based on the color of your opponent's characters, and you could like change your opponent's character's colors, and that would give you bonus effects. That's really cool. That's mm-hmm. very, very cool. And um, it's funny whereas... because it's based on the show too. Oh, it, it might be. I don't know. I didn't no, know no, it's, it is. I like Kanan <laughs> is a good show, but it's like Kanan. the fact that they they're able to like they they really did port things from the shows into the into the early sets. They did a fantastic job of that. And like that's yeah. something I really love about early Weiss is they loaded the flavor to the max. Yeah, and like now I I look at you know. Um, uh, like data life for example and it's just like it, it, it's like they didn't even show up to work okay they just they got the intern and they were like here's the template that you need to use um and it needs to have these cards and then just print some other crap and it'll fill out the rest of the slots even Ilya, right which Ilya is um kind of like my i don't know i don't know if people the the puyo meme or the kaleidoscope meme is stronger um, but it's one of those two uh, Ilya the the way that i viewed that that set when it first came out was just from the mathematical standpoint that's why the meme started was because of mathematically how good it was now that i look at the rebuild and i'm kind of like floating around am i getting back into this game now for the again for the meme value to it um i it's one of the few sets that i and i genuinely believe this that just somehow whoever's designing some of these newer cards has kept in the back of the mind like clearly this person played storm they played storm in magic at some point um because they keep printing cards that are just storm cards um and they i i can see that there's someone like who's sitting in a back office in bushy road who's occasionally they're allowed to like poke their head out and and like when they're not being like fed scraps and, and they come out with something cool like i saw lost decade that's a really cool set that's an incredible set. Like the the artwork is gorgeous. The card, the mechanic of like the cards that go to memory and come back, amazing, fantastic. Ten out of ten. Um, you bet the set sucked. Yeah, I think that's the point though. Like every every set that's come out, every set that's come out with strong flavor has generally kind of sucked these past few years. Uh, Lost Decade has been pretty weak. Uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is pretty weak. Oh my god, JoJo's dude. <laughs> What else? They wanted JoJo's to be good. I also wanted JoJo's to stands out. Would have been fucking sick. What a lost opportunity. Honestly, yeah. I I could design a better JoJo set in fifteen minutes. Um, <laughs> bro, that was so disappointing to look at. And I quite I quite like um, JoJo. Yeah. They, they sacrificed the set to the gods and hoped that every other set would sell better. And Star Star Wars. Hello. Can we? I mean. it's Star Wars was um w- was shafted because of licensing reasons, as far as I understand. Um, I I wasn't playing when Star Wars came out, so I I'm not entirely sure. That's my but understanding I, as well. Yeah, I think because I know Ken in Australia, we weren't allowed to use it. Uh, we, were. we weren't allowed to use it for official events, but for like stores weren't uh, able to get them from the official distributor and stuff either but that obviously right. doesn't stop people from just getting their oh yeah their cards yeah. elsewhere and putting them in locals so uh, that's about it again that was the time where we didn't have official tournaments so like it, it didn't really matter well yeah no that's true as well we didn't have any official tournaments for jp um star wars is a really cool set i mean i i, I remember reading through those cards and just going wow there's some there's some really hot stuff here if they didn't make like three well, if they put in just three good cards in, like, red, for example, I think that's the Darth Vader color. Yeah. Um, yeah I remember right. reading through that and going, yeah, this is literally three cards off being um, uh, a very, like, hyper-playable set. Kiznaiva, um was... <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. We, this was going to happen at some point, right? Oh, so let's course. talk about Kiznaiva. Okay. <laughs> um, I think... I don't remember what the character's name is. Ken, you're going to have to help me out here, man. The green zero that like has all the bond interactions. Uh, um, Utah. Yeah, Utah. Th- that's it, Utah. Yeah. I remember seeing that card coming out and just saying, wow, this is such an interesting mechanic. And it's so, it's broken. It is genuinely broken. It's one of the best support cards. Well, it's not support. Uh, when I say support, it's one of the best uh, like consistency effect that has yeah. ever been printed in the game. Um, and it was printed alongside 
a level one combo that was one of the best consistency options that we had ever seen in the game. And I just went, like, how can this not be nuts? How can they screw this up, right? But by the time they'd released the rest of the cards, I was so committed to the meme that I couldn't back down. So uh, <laughs> I was I was left with this, uh, you know, even at its best, like, it was a tier two set that I forced to be tier 1.5. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it, it was so disappointing to see like that, that really, again, this was, they let the guy um, uh, out of the, out of his, his, his kennel, right? They, they mm -hmm. finally let him come in and they were like, cool, he's going to print. And clearly it's the same person who designed this set who designed some of the other sets and you can just tell by looking at some of the effects um you know oh yeah we're gonna print a card that like lets you um shoot back row we're gonna print a card that interacts with bonds um but it's uh every time you bonds so that's gonna be like the core mechanic of the set we're gonna print uh, a really like interesting way to do stock charging it's gonna be based on 2k1 which is not standard anymore um but we're gonna just try and force it anyway we're gonna print a way to heal during your opponent's turn using excessive stock that comes on a counter and we're going to try and revitalize the bodyguard mechanic. Like so much stuff that came out in this set was completely off the chain. And um, and then because their level one combo was a bit dubious and their two to three was too expensive um, and their level zero was missing one card, uh, this set just never took off. Um, because, yeah, at the end, probably the execs came in and they were like, all right, buddy, uh, you know, listen, Craig or whatever this guy's name is, that it, he comes up with all the interesting effects. Uh, you got to go back in your cave now. Um, none of this. This is far too interesting for the for the good people of uh, um, uh, of the Weiss Schwartz community. Uh, Bridger didn't give us enough money for this set to be this pushed. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it was, but and that that always really ticked me off. I mean, that's one of the things that has always ticked me off. Bush Road has never made trigger sets good. <laughs> um, what's trigger? So trigger's uh, an anime there's, studio there's... that. Uh, <laughs> came out oh of the God, grave of the studio that made neon genesis evangelion oh yeah. okay no these guys did like um like kill the kill yeah so kill right. kill the kill first set is garbage um it's actually pretty decent with the power up set but you know first release sucks um darling in the franks kind of worked out in the end but it was clearly not designed to be good bro i know about that show oh i know this one it was controversial uh, i hear it's just kind of bad before they called it Trigger, but Grin Lagoon is by the same the team that eventually uh, went off to become Trigger, and that set was released on the same day as Hina Logic. Never gonna let that one down. Um, yeah, th there's just traditionally never been a first release from uh, Bush Road of a set that was animated by Trigger that has really been good. What's super interesting though is all the trigger sets are pretty flavorful because like in Gurren Logan, one of the things that happens yes. in the show is uh, they just cram the robot together to make a bigger, yeah, they yeah. cram different robots together to make a bigger robot. And in the last episode, they pull the robot apart and that's your yeah. finisher. Yeah, see, that's, yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, for uh, Darling in the Franks, the big thing is like you and your partner like do a mind meld through your, through your <laughs> pelvis and uh, pilot a robot together. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you do a mind belt through their pelvis to pilot their robot. I don't know what uh, sex ed classes are like in... in, in, in they don't have any. But... That, that's actually a plot point. <laughs> they, they don't have sex ed, so like, there's a lot of stuff going on with teenage angst, and that, that's just... Sorry, are you talking about Calgary, or are you talking about this, this, this show? In, in Darling in the Franks, like, Darling. the lack of sex education is a plot point. <sighs> He's not okay. kidding. <laughs> but basically, yeah, you merge a you make you merge a male character and a female character, and then you summon a robot and put them under the robot card. Okay, um, like, this is how the show works, and it's actually cool. So it's actually, like these honestly, sets are actually fucking flavorful. Yeah, when I'm looking at the list of sets that came out, I reckon there's more sets where the where the flavor is a bit more subtle, like you can't actually, uh, if you don't know this series, you wouldn't be able to just look at the set and say, hey, I can see what happens in this show. But like there are sets where I assume that if you know the series, um, it makes sense and you can, like it's a nod to what happens in the show. So maybe it's not necessarily that like flavor is completely waning. It's just that they made it uh, like less the focus of the set and more just like a running theme. 
and I think that's kind of the the issue that I I saw happen with the game um, after a certain point was so the, actually actually the only time that I remember good flavor turning into um, or just an interest I'll, I'll call it an interesting mechanic because again like I I admit that I haven't seen these shows uh, interesting mechanic turning into um, in, into a very playable set was uh, one Nisekoi and two Attack on Titan. Um, I think Nisekoi, as far as I understand, there's something to do with like memories and all this sort of stuff. And that's how that whole, um, uh, like you play the pendants, they go to the memory, and then when you have enough memory, then your characters become stronger. Um, yeah. Like that was fine. And that's that's it's very simple. It's very basic, but it gets there. Um, Attack on Titan. I know the 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 counter, the maneuver counter, which let you move your cards around. Is like the characters in the show have that equipment, and they you know I don't know teleport around or something. I don't know. Um, and fine, like that that was cool, um, and it was a very good set as well. And those are those are the only two that I remember because I, I stopped really playing um, very often uh, after pretty soon after that. Whereas. <laughs> What, what, what's happened okay go uh, well i i mentioned this title just a bit earlier but you didn't play during this time but hino logic from local logic was also very strong in flavor because it adapted from another game that bushiro had killed off by that point and it ended up becoming one of the most egregious sets to be printed so i think that's another good example yeah and it, it, it's good it's good when that sort of thing happens it shouldn't be in my opinion, when it comes to card design for a game which has such a unique way of printing its cards and that they are modular um, and uh, you, you're essentially getting, okay, we have a whole set that fits into this archetype, whole set that fits into this archetype. You can only play the cards specifically. You can't cross them over because standard is a horrible format. Never play it. It's busted. Um, it, it, it feels to me that there should be a little bit more emphasis on that. We shouldn't be able to go through and be like, oh, do you remember that one set that was really good because it was uh very flavorful and it had a unique and cool mechanic and it was also a very playable set i think that's a that's not the way that, that you should be talking well, what you should be saying is oh uh isn't it weird that data live is generic and just has a bunch of template cards um unlike every other set which is so much more interesting but somehow this set is also good and playable we don't like that um, please pull up your your pants, Bushy Road, and 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 start doing some good things again. I mean, that would be nice um, if if there were actually cool mechanics. And I understand there's limitations to to doing that, right? Like, you know, maybe you just need to have better people working or re reduce the number of releases that you have. I, I don't know what the solution to it is. Okay, um, I genuinely don't because I don't know how Bushy Road really works um, in the back. But yeah. I do just, I just wish, right? I really like, uh, like I wish Puyo. Let's talk about Puyo. Can we talk about Puyo? Oh, Puyo is flavorful as fuck. Is it? Yeah. Like all of the decks have something to do with clear. Like if you like brainstorm a Puyo, as if like you're clearing them out in the game. No, no, no. Okay, okay. But the actual meta. Like, sorry. Well, I should, oh. Can I call it the meta deck? Can I say like my list? Right. Like the the you Puyo list that I created. Good. Okay, fine. So the Puyo <laughs> list that I created, which went on to be sort of like how it was played, like using Margaro, using the one zero bomb, and then turboing into Arl and just blowing people up with just sheer statistics and just big stonks. Yeah. yeah. Right. I didn't use any of the unique mechanics, right? I right. can, again, I can break down this whole deck. I had a runner. Um, I had a, a one zero that clock searched. Um, I had a bunch of brainstorms. I had a stock bomb. Um, there was, uh, I think, uh, no, I cut the spammable brainstorm eventually. Um, I had a bond, uh, the bond bonded to my level three. Um, cool. Level one, we had the most insane consistency card that had ever been printed and it was printed at co uh, common rare. What was Maguro? It was definitely not a double R. Um, uh, uh, common. It, Let's check. Who, who knows? But it wasn't a double R, right? Well, that's no. all I know, because because Japan was playing witch, ha, you monkeys. Uh, <laughs> this welcome to welcome to the big boys league. Yeah, uh, we're it's playing. Rare. It's rare. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was playing a level one consistency combo, a level one bomb, level two. What was happening? We had a uh, like a, a an anti level killer suicide or whatever you want to call them, and a bunch of early plays. 
uh, and the early plays search cards off the top of your deck then you hit level three and you instantly killed people with your ridiculous cancel combo none of the good cards in that set were puyo based i didn't What's... play yeah any because of I've... the the cool things because mm. i've seen a lot of north american players uh they've started you if they play Poyo at all, uh, this was probably 2017, 2018, they started using the red Poyo brainstorm because uh, it allows you to salvage if you hit a red Poyo. And yeah, then the Poyos so themselves get pretty that. meaty on field. Yeah, but we already had, right? And like part of the, I, I, I tried all that shit out when it came out. Mm. Why didn't I use it? Because we already had a, a brainstorm, which was a tap self brainstorm that gave your center hex proof. And it let you salvage already, and it hit it hit on climaxes. So I didn't have to run eight more cards in right. order to hit the same level of consistency. Like we had a, a free refresh where you could just discard a card out of your hand, and you got to free refresh for no reason. It, it was really absurd, like really, really absurd. How a set which uh, I get it, like I, it's like a Tetris game or something, right? Yes. And um, you know, I came in and I made a version of this deck which used none of those cards, and it was just template, you know strict deck building like what are the core what are the best effects at every single level ignore every mechanic that could potentially make this set flavorful um and that was the best version of the deck. and i and i to this day i believe it was the best version of the deck and i i believe that i was in you know 49 out of 50 cards um from having the best possible version of that deck um and i proved it because i because i won a bunch of events why right. is that the way that i'm building decks why did i i built this puyo deck the same way that i built to Lovery, pretty much except that i didn't have um a money counter um instead i had something else like i mean the decks were basically built in exactly the same way it's just that puyo was better um and or well, at least i i thought it was better you know that shouldn't be the way that that, that this game play i i mean i've talked about this for a long time and i think i'm laboring the point but you know it's it's, it's always been a pet peeve and it's part of the reason i stopped playing is i hated sitting down across from like six different decks in a day and they would all play in exactly the same way whatsoever but i just i you know i don't know how to read the cards and my opponent would be explaining the same effects to me over and over again you could they could have literally just sat down and like just given me a deck list and gone four runners four brainstorms uh as i said before and, yeah, and like, that would make things easier yeah and no i i 100 appreciate where you're coming from rant like, over rant over because like yeah sometimes it's like here i could like for weeklies it's like yeah sure i could win 20 bucks by uh, just going out playing like super meta deck and just playing the same game four times or i could pull out like a, a deck that has some flavor that i actually like i'll lose but i'll have fun yeah right like ken like what do you play right now oh i currently play shiny claws and i'm waiting on grisaya like are they fun are, are they cool like <laughs> Yeah, no I think that I think that just comes down to opinion, so it's going to be entirely subjective. But um, I quite like shiny colors. I guess it's not. Uh, it's probably towards the weaker end of releases that came out this year. But as I said earlier, I think uh, every like, without having explained how shiny colors works, like I, I like the way that they bring in flavor without uh completely changing how the cards would work. Um, it's a lot more subtle than in other sets like Darling and the Franks, which I've also played before. So, uh, yeah, I like it. Um, I also think that you kind of just look at like what the cards do in a vacuum and say, oh, this like kind of does like this fits this role, this fits this role. And yeah, I agree that this set, uh, sorry, not this, this game has many decks where you put cards in to fit a role. But at the same time, I feel like the small differences between cards also do count. And uh, that that's what makes the game more interesting for me. Like when I look at my mm. opponent's runner, like obviously the runner in, say, um, shiny colors is a completely different card to the one in Kaguya. I don't. I assume you wouldn't know what those mean, but yeah, like I, I think the small differences is what makes this more interesting. And when you know what all the cards in the game do, uh, it definitely does sort of change the experience more in terms of how you want to play your deck. No, like I definitely. I really appreciate that uh, kind of view on it. Although, uh, I guess it also doesn't help that if you're playing in smaller communities and you've only been playing against the same people, they kind of have the same tastes. So it does kind of feel, even though that small subtlety, if people aren't buying new sets, it, you, you don't get that full flavor of what Weiss has to offer. Because, like, honestly, I, I wish Lost Decade was, was good, man. Because, like, 
having a, equip items and wife would actually be sick yeah i mean again yeah. like yeah I, I i can fix lost decade in, in five minutes like it, it, and, and make this i mean i could make a busted in five minutes as well but i can make a playable in five minutes and and not be stunted um by some of the cards that that, that you have to play in it and um and that would actually you know that that would mean that we'd see some more interesting stuff and i think you know maybe maybe it's a bit rough because i maybe my card design background is a little bit more rigorous than some of the people who who are designing cards for what i don't know what their background is right i have i have literally no idea but mm -hmm. it shouldn't be the case that every time i look at a set even new one i mean i've i've sort of i've looked at releases as they've come out every once in a while you know i shouldn't be able to look at a card and and say like like, why are we still calling cars Rickies? Like, that, that's... I get that you have to have fundamental archetypes. Uh, like, certain cars, which just, they're just good, right? Like, pay one clock on search for a level one of law. It's just a really good card. It's a fantastic corner centerpiece. Um, I should be able... Does Data Live have one? Um, uh, I, think it, I think it does, but nobody it, plays it. Now, it now does. Um, it's... I think the only card that was added to the eight standby deck after the extra booster. Right, yeah, so, it does... so they got one. They got one after an expansion, yeah. Right. I mean, like that 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 deck was already good beforehand. Um, why is it that then it couldn't stay that way? Um, you know, why why did we then have to add in this like very template card and be like, oh, okay, now it's you know six percent better? Um, well, because we now run I think that card copies. was more specifically released to support the new archetype that they wanted to push with the extra booster release um it, yeah it's just a generic effect so like it is going to fit in some of the older sets but uh the idea was probably just more to fit with the new expansion but that's also brings me though, right? with uh with lost decade i also feel that's one of the sets that they may have released with a weaker pool initially because they were planning an expansion and then uh, the game's no longer owned by Bushroot, so that kind of just fell apart. Um, there are, <laughs> like, there are, there are definitely sets. Uh, this is actually a pretty big trend among sets uh, which are primarily or fully owned by Bushroot, where the first set is generally pretty weak, and the second set just pushes it over the top. Uh, we've seen historical examples with uh, Love Life Sunshine, Hina Logic. I think Milky Homes was initially not that great. Uh, Bang Dream set one was pretty mid. But then, you know, uh, once the second set comes out, all of these sets start beco uh, becoming, like, powerful meta contenders. And I felt like maybe Lost Decade was in that position, except some stuff uh, unrelated to Lobby West just kind of um, went differently. And they said, well, we're not rebuying the rights to something we once owned, which didn't even sell that well initially, just so we can make a better set out of it. Of course it didn't sell that well. Look at the cards. Yeah. The deck yeah, just doesn't I mean, work. I think... Yeah, I think originally, like, they could afford to do that because if they own the IP, they don't need to pay as much right. to uh, release a set for it. But then, like, by the by the time it's like, oh, it got sold away, then, like, they, they don't even want to do that anymore. I, I feel yeah. like that wasn't necessarily on the fault of the WS designers if that's what happened. And I feel like there's a pretty good chance that was what actually did. And I guess the other thing is they were probably hoping that uh, they would get fans of the game coming in to buy the sets right so you get yeah. cross promotion for the game and the set which seems pretty uh that seems marketing 101 but mm -hmm. one of the things i actually this is something i noticed when i was just around around tokyo uh last year this was actually around when jojo was coming out i only saw one weiss ad all over tokyo and really? it was like under a bridge in akihabara like it wasn't even a good place well, I don't. I don't think any of the bridges in Akihabara looked that nice yet. But there was like, bu <laughs> there was like buddy, there was like buddy fight ads in subway stations. It was bizarre. Yeah, I think WS is generally like kind of just promoted inside card stores. Um, like I don't, I don't think that many people come into WS like straight without playing any other card game ever. And I don't know if uh, I don't know what Butcher's market research is telling them, but I, I do mm. feel that yeah they don't really promote the game uh outside of areas where people would already play cards or um on tv commercials where you know you're watching what's an anime that's airing recently that is in WS. you're watching uh, Mushoku Tensei 
and then an ad comes on for the WS uh, for the WS set. Like, yeah, I, I, I reckon like that's as much effort they give to WS advertising. Well, the other thing is, if you look through uh, Bushy's financial statements, you'll notice that like uh, WS isn't even in like their holdings over a couple of billion yen, and like their big holdings. Last time I checked their I checked their IPO filing on the Nikkei. And it was like their big ones are like Vanguard, Buddy Fight, Japan Pro Wrestling, and yeah. I want to say uh, Bang Dream. So <laughs> like why Schwartz what? doesn't crack that. Well, remember, Bushy Road's a, a conglomerate. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a division that is, is somehow involved in railways. Uh, like that's just how Japanese companies work. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know you've made it big time when you have a railway division. But, <laughs> yeah. I think they only went public recently, so... Yes. By recently, I mean, like, the last two or three years. But... I want to say 2019 is when their IPO was. Yeah, yeah. But it was really interesting oh. because then you realize that, yeah, compared to Vanguard, yeah, Weiss isn't that big, so I wouldn't be surprised if Weiss is just playing third fiddle. Hmm. But it's pretty interesting because as, as, uh, as far as I remember from a different source... Uh, I think it, it's Oricon, yeah. According to Oricon, WS and Vanguard are usually like roughly the same amount, uh, same amount of sales. Okay. Obviously, uh, it probably costs less to make Vanguard than it uh, does to create WS because of um, licensing issues. But yeah, I feel like they've kind of just settled for where they are at in WS. And unless they manage to get a hold of a really big IP that everyone wants to get, uh, I feel like it's kind of just got its position in Japan, but they could honestly do a bit more outside of Japan. I feel like in terms of advertising, just just make tournaments. I mean, look, okay. So, do you guys know what Flesh and Blood is? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Right. Flesh and Blood is a card game. Who, by the way, uh, I should probably like disclose. I I uh, I'm fairly well linked to this game, um, but I I don't work for them. Um, Flesh and Blood is a card game that was made in New Zealand, um, and it came out just over, sorry, just under two years ago now. Um, mm. It is designed, ex it's it's basically designed to be a pro tour level game. Okay. Um, and it is they there's a part of it that is designed to be for the collectors. There's like first release product and very hard to win prize cards that some of these cards go for, um, and I'm not exaggerating, $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. Um, but there are also regular like day-to-day -day play versions of those cards that are 100 bucks. Yeah. So they've hit the market of collectors. They've hit the market of players. The first tournament that was ever run for this game had $10,000 cash prize. Less than two years later, they've just announced a world championship and a pro tour series with a one million dollar prize pool. Right? Why? Uh, it, it is not, and this is a game coming out of New Zealand, right? This is not a large economy, um, right. and it's pretty much they they don't have formal advertising. It's pretty much all done word of mouth um, via card stores, uh, etc. So, how is it that two years? after a game like this coming out, um, they can come out with, excuse me, a high-end competitive scene that caters to a high-end competitive market. Uh, and they can foster a professional tournament environment through COVID, no less, right? COVID has gone on for 50% of this game's life cycle. Whereas, you know, a lot of uh, games like Y Schwartz can barely even put a tournament together in countries, like in Australia in particular, um, they can barely put a tournament together. But even in the rest of the the Western world, there's very little yeah. care that's put together in fostering a tournament scene. Now, some people might say, well, the reason these guys can put together a $1 million prize pool is because they have a player base that's loyal to them and they're dedicated and they play competitively. Yes, so would Weiss if Weiss was putting out regular... I mean, if Weiss, Weiss had put tournaments... In the effort. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. If Bushy Road was putting out tournaments where... I mean, I it, like I said, if I could see a pathway where I could qualify for Worlds within 12 months, and I could actually see that in front of me, and it was reasonable, and there was a way for me to do it, I would be playing this game very, very often, right? Because the meme value of me taking Kaleidoscope to Worlds is literally infinite, right? Um, mm. The 
the the flip side of that is you know do the players want to be involved in this sort of thing and some people say oh you know like a lot of people who play this game just interested in it because they like the series that they're playing or they like the anime um sure uh but don't tell me that if even if you're just a casual player and you find out that you can like rock up to a tournament and like win some really cool promo for your waifu or whatever i don't know what you guys are interested in right you can win a limited edition body pillow is that's what the kids are into is, is that is that what you guys do um i haven't yeah, heard a like, body pillow joke in years <laughs> i don't know maybe but this is a two, <laughs> 2008 joke right yeah yeah um, but Wife, yeah, you're the, so funny yeah that's there you go right so this is the this whatever incentive needs to be given um limited edition product whatever it is just run actual tournaments and the game will skyrocket and uh, and and people will be more interested in the sets like you can do more adventurous things we have more uh more things i mean it's a formula that not only flesh and blood is doing i mean magic did it back in the day Yu-Gi-Oh has done it pokemon has done it you look at pokemon nowadays compared to pokemon 10 years ago oh, yeah. totally different game totally different game um uh, uh so you know the, the formulas exist and I mean, I, I don't know why Bushy Road continues. I mean, even before I left and even after I'm, you know, hovering around, uh, you know, their the, the, the marketing um, and the way that they've approached the competitive side of things, it's never changed. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of, it's unfortunate, but we have to kind of accept that that's the way that it's going to be, I think. And and that does mean that, and there there is a, there is a, a silver lining to this, it does mean that it does inspire a lot of really good community integration from the community, like not inspired by Bushy Road, like running things like the 2012 Legacy Tournament, um, where it's a purely community run event. And I think supporting those sorts of things and supporting any sort of community content creation, things like that are really what's keeping this game alive more than Bushy Road ever will, because they clearly refuse to support it in the traditional sense right they support it in a monetary way that benefits them but they don't support it in a way that encourages players to continue wanting to play the game at a high level well, um really yeah. interesting is i've heard from uh one of a, a few store owners now that it is actually really tough to support bushy road games because like not only is are they not doing this tournament seed they don't really give uh, the stores ways to get new players in the door so like magic like the stores will get like oh here's a here's a starter deck we could just give you on the house pokemon you have really lots of really cheap ways into the game but weiss doesn't have that and bushy road will probably never do it yeah i mean trial decks are, are cool but yeah like they kind of have those beginner decks but not they either aren't really a thing or they print them wrong so it's like it's very hard for the stores to get people through the door as well and yeah I mean, Ken would know this better than I would, but like, well, what is the Weiss situation in, in stores in terms of product, like in Australia? I, I have no idea what it is. Uh, what do you mean by like the situation? Like, can, can, like we, we... can we actually buy product? Like, is there a, yeah. can, can I, can I walk into a store and be like, Hey, I'd like to buy a pack of Puyo Puyo. Well, you won't be able to get old sets like that. Cause, um, oh, okay. like, well, like, like, what, sorry. Yeah, but like, what, you, I... you can get any, like you can always uh, get like the newer stuff at the stores that carry it here. And uh, if you are interested in an upcoming set, you can definitely talk to the guy behind the counter and discuss if you can do a pre-order and stuff like that. It's not that bad um, in that element. But I think What's, in terms so of I mean, the, start, yeah. I think in terms of like the demo decks and the tournament stuff, there it. Well, starting from tournaments, uh, I, I don't. I think that. Bushiro generally wants their tournaments to be like free entry and kind of uh, a mix between casual and competitive players. They just want uh, everyone to be able to go there and not have to worry too much about entry fee and all of that. And they want to prioritize that over running more competitive events. I don't, uh, I think if they wanted to gain more players, maybe running uh, a separate set of more competitive geared events on top of uh, the current style of tournaments they already hold might be the way to go. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. what. Or their research is telling them, but uh, I think, yeah, th it's just more about the philosophy they have behind how they want to run games. Uh, they just want it to have a good crossover between casual and competitive. And I think, in, just in terms of game design, they have kind of uh, been able to do that pretty well in WS. Uh, it's one of those games where you can uh, sit down and not really have to ask what your opponent uh, 
kind of once out of the game and just pull out whatever deck you want. As long as the decks came out within like a couple of years of each other, you can still enjoy a game. You, um, even if you do win pretty convincingly, your opponent still felt like they played the game and it has that good element in it. In terms of promos and demo decks and stuff, I think this is just more about the the nature of the game that we were talking about, how sets are not non-mixable, modular. Right. Um, so it's really hard to just have demo decks because people don't get interested in a game and like want to play the game when the demo deck you're using is Milky Homes and like no one knows what the hell Milky Homes is uh, outside of Japan, really. But what happened to the Shioko stuff? Shioko... Uh, that's not really... A th they don't have a full set in English. Um, honestly, if they wanted to print demo decks, it's probably a bit better than Milky Homes, but, like, it still suffers from that same issue where you have a character who, like, the guy who walked in the store is unable to recognize, is totally not here to play the game with that. So, yeah. uh, the better way of doing it is probably just, um, either the store or players who have excess trial deck cards just, like, donate their extra trial deck stuff and, like, leave it in the store as a demo deck of sorts. Mm. Um, I think coming. I joked about it on Twitter the other day, but coming uh, with Hollow Live coming out, I feel like VTubers are a pretty recognizable face. Oh my god! And if and you know, knowing knowing how much people like VTubers, uh, there's definitely going to be people who are buying like tubes of TDs and going to have excess uh, excess cards from that. So if those guys just you know make good use of their cards by donating their excess TDs to stores and putting them like the cheapest leaves that they can on them as uh, demo decks like that's probably the best way to start in terms of teaching people you can't give those yeah. out though so there is still an issue there but uh, i feel a lot of the stuff that you want to apply for other games to ws is a bit difficult just because of the way uh, ws is and bushroad's philosophy okay that actually that makes a lot of sense and i'm really glad you kind of really explained that and one of the things i do think that bushroad did do a good job at least with the demo decks in north america is picking batman for a demo deck oh amazing yeah, really good. yeah everyone adventure knows time batman. Also has one, right? yeah everyone knows yes batman. adventure time has one too yeah so it's like I hope they do keep doing that actually yeah yeah but didn't they like accidentally get the wrong name on batman so you could change uh, a level zero <laughs> yes. to level three or something yeah yes. yeah yeah but, but, sick one guys like that while, while that is like a kind of an issue but it, it's the idea of like using Batman at Adventure Time or like recognize like as demo decks is a brilliant idea, I think. Um, mm -hmm. The mess up is like not directly tied to the idea itself. Like they could like it, it. It didn't need to happen. It's just uh, someone was a bit careless. So yeah, I, I think you're right. Batman at Adventure. Yeah. Time okay. Works. Trans. I have no sympathy whatsoever for found translations. Okay. How many languages do you think? Um, like when you're designing a uh, like a magic card or a Yu-Gi-Oh card or, or, or like or Pokemon has a ton oh, too. Yeah. Magic and, also has and, a lot of mistranslations though. <laughs> recently. Right. No, no, but I mean like in the in the development phase, right? The there are people from all different creeds and backgrounds and um who all speak different languages who design cards. And somehow they manage to come up with fewer errors than than translated Y sets. Like English Weiss, I remember when English Weiss started picking up in australia and I, I never really played english wise but i specifically remember people complaining about translations all the time i mean just every single set i i, I think when i when it was around there was not a single set that came out that did not have a translation error i mean um oh i can tell you the exact numbers for that one uh sorry going back to one of my blog posts uh the mean number of errors in a set was 2.78 with a standard deviation of 2.7 Lol. The min was okay. zero. The the max was thirteen. Oh my god! Yeah. With an interquartile range of one to four, so about half of the sets Jeez. had between one to four errors. Yeah. Um, Eighty nine percent of sets had an error. Yeah. Well, I think Batman's demo deck was not like really a translation issue. It was more just whoever was doing it kind of didn't think about uh how having the same card name for like different cards would have an issue uh would come up with problems but yeah but english for sure uh sorry english wise specifically not i think vanguard doesn't actually have that many mistranslations funnily enough but yeah they're pretty infamous for their translation errors um the sheer amount of them really and yeah. I, I do hope they work on that <laughs> okay
<laughs> Moving on. <laughs> well, it's like, of course, it's freaking Batman that has like such a massive error because you can't even blame it on translation. Yeah. yeah. I have heard that English is at least in the since I wrote that article, English has gotten better. Uh, it has gotten better, I believe. I haven't been keeping particularly close watch. I remember that card in Data Live, which allows you to shuffle back climaxes until they um, right. eroded it like two weeks after it was pointed out. But there, there's few, <laughs> there's a few floating around, but it has improved, I believe. Oh wow! Yeah, because like Fujimi Bunko had 14 errors, if I remember <laughs> yeah, correctly. Fujimi had like the front card of the set had an error, like one in ten cards had an error. Uh, yeah, Bank Room Volume Two had a card which had to be eroded twice in like a week because they didn't pick up on the second error the first time. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of quality issues. control. <laughs> is just yeah, I don't know. It's pretty awful. It's something which, again, you know, it makes it so that like I'm glad that if if I ever choose to come back to the game, like I have, and actually here here's another thing. You know, it, it just so turns out that the set that I decided to go in hard on the meme for, Ilya, yeah, yeah. Um, after I left, continued to get support because it, it was a fate set. And uh, I guess they came out with more more shows or, or something. Um, so it continued to get support. If I had, and, and this is something which is always like, I understand the marketing behind it of, of you know, you the, the things that have more shows or more popularity get more sets. Um, I get that um, it, it does it does make it so that when I decide to come back into the game, I don't have to necessarily restart. I can I can pick up something that I used to have and just update it. And that's a really good thing about having eternal formats, um, which is one thing that Weiss does really, really well. And I'll give it, I'll grant that to them is it makes it easier for for like me to come back in or anyone to come back in. Um, the flip side of that is that um, if I decide to come back in and I want to play uh, top level decks, um, some of the stuff like actually finding some of the cards is extraordinarily difficult um, mm -hmm. for for certain things, and I've always wondered. You know, I I figured the reprint policy is that they just or well, they don't reprint sets once they're once they're done, right? They they just they print it and then um, shoot and it goes. I've always wondered if that if that was the correct way to do things, um, uh, or or if it's just totally cost ineffective. I I mean, you know, it's it's always just something that's popped up in my mind. I don't have an answer for it. I don't know if anyone has an answer for it, but it, it's something that that I've I've thought about. They reprint. If the demand is there, so like I think Konosuba got some reprints. Yeah. Data Live got a re. Data Live got an English reprint. Data Live oh. got an English reprint. Uh, Persona Five got an English reprint as well. Yeah, I believe. So if demand's there, they will reprint. The Jazz Persona. <laughs> Jazz Sona. <laughs> is is that the one where the character ended up in Smash Bros? Is that is yes. that the same one? Yeah, it's yeah, same that's one. That's the one. Uh, yes, Jazz Persona. It's good stuff. So we've kind of had a really long, wide-ranging conversation here. So I'm going to bring it back to uh, the reason why I brought you guys on the show in the first place is that you both were the commentary duo for the 2012 Legacy Tournament hosted by Dan's Ranch and Strictly Broken TCG. So seeing as most of the key organizers from this tournament are in North America, how did you guys end up getting tapped on the shoulder for the commentary duo? Uh, Ken, didn't you put yourself forward? Oh, yeah, I kind of jokingly said on one of the Discord thing, hey, can I commentate? And then, uh, yeah, I, I was half joking. And Bishro, uh, not Bishro, sorry, UA said, yeah. So I said, oh, <laughs> cool. Uh, I guess I'll do that. <laughs> so this is what happened was, was UA messaged me. And um, uh, he was like, hey, man, um, you know, uh, first of all, like UA and I used to kind of have beef when we were, when we were younger. Mm. Um, and he reached out to me and he was just like, hey, man, look, and I look, I'd never really, I hadn't thought of it um, for, for such a long time. Um, he reached out to me and he was like, hey, man, you know, I know we had beef when we were kids, but, you know, we're all grown up. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, it was it was good shit posting when we were younger. We're, we're all grown up now and uh, uh, we're good mates. And he said, listen, I'm running a 2012 event. You know, what would be funny is if like one of the 
uh, he, he was he basically he pitched it as like yeah you're like one of the more iconic players from that era um at least among the boomers the vast majority of people the vast majority of people who are listening to this have no idea who i am because they weren't playing back then yeah, yeah. He, he said look you know i know i know you 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 played back then um and uh i've done commentary for um just uh, other stuff as well like uh poker events when i haven't been playing in them or you know um the football and things like that mm. so he, he said Did, would you want to just come and do this and i said yeah sure uh, it seems funny um uh, but i'm gonna need like i'm gonna need a crutch to lean on because it has been a long time since i played this game and he said oh well ken ken said that he would do this so um how does that work out and i said well that's fantastic we literally live down the road from each other we know each other fairly well we used to play together back when I played. So yeah, easy. Um, and uh, yeah, look, so huge shout outs to you way for um, giving me the opportunity to do that and, and sort of make my re debut back into the game. And obviously thanks to you as well for bringing, bringing us on here and, and, and me in particular, because again, I'm sort of like floating around this idea and uh, of, of will I be back? And, you know, like is the kaleidoscope article ever going to happen? Um, that's a funny meme for three people in the audience right now who know what I'm talking about. You know what, Philip? Throw that stake down. Make the announcement right here, right now. For what? For the kaleidoscope article? For the kaleidoscope article, for your re-entry device. Just do it right uh, now. Nah, okay. Uh, look, I... Um, I, I would on. love you've been, to. You've been, you've been spitting vinegar this whole episode. Deep in your heart, you know you want to play this game. Throw whoa, the stake whoa, down whoa. right here. Or if you think this is vinegar, hold oh boy, don't don't, don't <laughs> catch Canadian. me at the grill. Um, uh, look, I I would love to say like yes, I'm back in. Um, unfortunately, so I I actually play cards for a living. Like yeah. this is actually my job. Um, not not playing Y specifically. No, no, no. So I would need to have like there would have to be a very very clear pathway for me to be able to um, go to worlds. Otherwise, my sponsors would just be like. Like we get that you can do it, but there's no like there's no financial benefit for you to take time out of playing poker right. gotcha. um, to come and play Weiss uh, professionally. So um, as much as I would love to, I I need to see that pathway somehow. And even if it even if that means like I fly to America or I fly to Europe and I participate in an event there and I qualify that way, then I would actually do it. Um, oh, okay. obviously with with co i can't fly out of the country right now i'm supposed to be mm -hmm. in vegas right now and I, i'm not um yeah, i'm missing out on like one of the largest events of my entire life because of uh lockdown um, right so you can't go to wpt or something like that exactly yeah <laughs> um uh, i can't i couldn't go to wsop i couldn't go to wpt um i i couldn't go to macau uh earlier this year like i yeah i've i've got absolutely roasted this year so I, you know what? Okay, this is what I will say. I will one hundred percent put out. Uh, does it have to be an like? It has to be an article. Like no one reads articles anymore. But I'll I'll write the kaleidoscope video. Article. Yeah, like, I'll do, do an I'll annotated do... video. Do, just get the kaleidoscope thing out. I'll 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 you know what? I'll stream. I'll 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 talk to I'll talk to Yue and we'll do a kaleidoscope stream and I'll 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 make it happen or, or something. I'll I'll, I'll figure yeah, yeah. out something and I'll. I will I will do the colli the updated kaleidoscope the mathematically correct kaleidoscope um and people can can watch me like goldfish this deck for 20 minutes that um you know can actually consistently hit double kaleidoscope um which is sounds like sounds insane but it's it's it is it is definitely doable yeah whether or not I'll actually take it to a world championship is entirely dependent on whether or not I see that that yeah. line if it is there then yeah i'll do it I, I i absolutely would and i know there'll be people who'd support me through it so i, I i'll be i'll be there yeah yep love to hear it and i guess folks heard it here first <laughs> okay this is the premier Y schwartz podcast the you premier. get to hear about some random australian boomer and uh, uh commentary duo um uh, popping up from from god knows where and like some guy who hasn't played the game for six years saying that he's going to qualify for world championships yeah very 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 hard hitting content here <laughs> hey i didn't pay for anyone to be here i'll take this, it it's true not yet not yet. Oh shit! Did I miss something in the writers? 
<laughs> oh boy. Oh no. Speaking about tournaments, uh, did you guys have any input on when the tournament started? Because we're rec- we started recording this at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. The tournament on Saturday, like Saturday passing, started at 9 a.m. Mountain. What time is that in Australia? Uh, I think we Still assembled at 11 p.m. and then started at 1 a.m. on Sunday. Oh, 1 a.m. Right. Like, yeah. The Saturday Sunday crossover night. So yeah, the tournament started at 1 a.m. for us. Uh, did we get any input on when it started? Um, no. Sort of. Like maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I I think it was just like you know, it's a weekend. I, I can stay up late. It's all right, and we we just went with it. Yeah, and... I mean, it, it was a bit of an awkward time, but yeah, I I'd already screwed up my uh my sleep schedule that week, so I just went, hey, you know what? I'll I'll just I'll ride this wave out and and uh, try and fix it later. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's it's really funny because I the only reason I fully clued into it. Was I remember I was talking with Kilua, one of the one of the main organize one of the guys who's doing a lot of work along with Dan and them, as they were saying they were they picked that time specifically to accommodate a lot of to accommodate people internationally, and then like I sat there thought that was thinking about it, and then you mentioned that Tom had stood you up somehow. Oh my god! So, and I'm like, <laughs> this, this doesn't up. work for anyone. Eddie doesn't work at all. <laughs> okay, I mean, when it comes to international online events, you're never going to be able to make everyone exactly. happy, and and. As Australians, we just have to accept the fact that we are always the ones who are not accommodated for. Um, mm. Shout outs to Riot Games. Uh, you fucked me for uh, for Rintera Worlds. Um, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a story. Uh, so, yeah, look, we always we always knew we were going to be on the on the weird time. Basically, what happened with Tom was I I had a really really long day. Um, the the night before we were going to do our rehearsal for the um, commentary and then I woke up and I said specifically I'm going to wake up at like 10 30 or 11 11 o'clock at night so that we can do this practice run and he was asleep um he didn't wake up and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning in whatever like godforsaken country he was in um Canada I guess uh uh and yeah, and, and he wasn't there for like half an hour or like 45 minutes or something. He just like didn't show up. And I was I was molding. I'm not gonna lie. I was I was sitting there just like I wanna be asleep right now. Like I gotta wake up tomorrow and like I gotta be in court and like, you know, do some actual uh actual stuff. And instead I'm sitting here waiting for some man to wake up so I can commentate him playing children's card games. Yeah. No, I'd be pissed too. <laughs> I love him. I love Tom, but yeah, fuck you, buddy. So, are you glad that I knocked about with fucking Macross Frontier? Oh, mate, that was so good. I didn't know a single thing that your deck did. <laughs> I saw Macross Frontier was represented and thought, hey, I would know this set, except you were playing the one color that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anything about blue. I All I knew was the character was called, like, Goth Lolly Trap, and I'm like, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I, I rate uh, the meme value of that card. Big thanks to Y Schwartz Portable for allowing me to experience these cards beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because I was like, I was doing some research on what people actually played in these tournaments. So I was going through like the Japanese worlds list. And every so often I'd see Backcross Frontier and I'd never see, and I wouldn't see blue until I saw that version of the list. I was like, what the fuck is this? And like I played Macross Frontier for like seven years, and I've never played Blue, so I'm in the same goddamn boat as you are. And then I saw it like two years ago, and I was just like, "What the fuck is this?" And I was like, "Wait, this shit's on standby. I'm playing it." Uh, the only thing that I knew about Macross, the only version of Macross that I ever played against, I played against it three times ever in my life, um, and it was actually when I was testing um, Kaleido uh, and actually trying to make it work back when it didn't have the tools to right. make it work when it was only two sets and there was a guy who rocked up to locals and he was playing the vajra build the the oh, spam. That awful thing yeah, yeah yeah he was playing the spam build and like i um i was playing with a mate of mine who was kind of helping me track stats and i i like 3 0 him and, and um uh, and my friend was like, oh, and we ended up looking at the numbers afterwards. And he was like, oh, you average like a like a 70 something percent win rate on Kaleidoscope um, across uh, uh, six weeks or something. And then 
Um, and then we had, we, I remember sitting down and then going, yeah, but the games against Macross Frontier didn't count because this guy was playing Vardra <laughs> and it just, I, I had no idea, you know, what the rest of the set did. Um, I really wanted to, so this is, this is some behind the scenes. Um, what we were actually at UA and I were planning and this didn't eventuate partially because I couldn't get a deck together because of COVID. Yeah. Um, we were going to do a little skit where like UA and I squashed our beef by like playing a game of um of Weishwatz, um on stream very funny and like trying to throw back to all the memes of when i play i think i, I played against him over skype or something and like we were just shit talking the entire time and like he was oh he was being mad disrespectful i was being extremely disrespectful as well um uh, i think it was i was playing to love Rue, and he was playing charlotte um, and he was trying to, uh, like, there was this argument about, like, oh, Tulavar auto lose to Shark has got anti burn or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, it was it was something stupid, right? That we were, you know, again, we were kids, we were arguing about. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do this skit where um, we played a game of Weishwatz and then, like, squashed our beef, um, kind of like a wrestling uh, skit uh, or whatever. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But what I was planning on doing was um, uh, just playing, um, having a Weishwatz deck, but playing uh, Exodia in it. And just flipping that out at some point and claiming that I'd won and then nice. moving on. Um, and he didn't know about this. Uh, <laughs> so that was the one thing that I, I wish we had done. And I, I, I was going to use, um, I was planning on using my Hime, which is, a, again, a, a set that just nobody knows. I, I, I have Canaan, but it's in, it's in France right now. Right. Uh, it's been in France for, you know, since the set came out. Um, mm. And I, I wasn't going to ship over um, th- this Max Rarity Canaan set, which is pretty much impossible to find yeah, um, yeah. over to Australia to try and uh, to try and play this. So I was going to use my Hime, but I couldn't find my Hime anyway. And then I was going to go to Melbourne to get uh, a deck from Alfred Yang. Um, he's a very, very uh, prominent Australian player. Lockdown happened. I didn't get a chance to go to Melbourne. I wasn't going to ask him to ship a deck over. So it just ended up not happening. Um, I do wish we'd had the opportunity to do that. Because I did think it would have been quite funny if I just pulled out Exodia and then claimed I'd won. Actually, and seen what really his reaction funny. would have been. Yeah. <laughs> I could see you oh, well. shitting his pants. It would have been good. Yeah, I'm sure he, he would have rolled with it too. Yeah. No, he would have been very mad. I, I'm, I'm sure of that. And that, that was the point. Okay. Actually, going back to like mad disrespect, uh, like when I was writing my, uh, writing my uh, tournament log for the blog, I was watching back over the stream to make sure I was remembering shit right. And my wife overheard some of the stuff you're saying about my deck. And uh, she started calling you Mr. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> well um what did i say about what did we did i say it did ken say it it was uh, me wasn't it it was you it was like something yeah. about like my list being disrespectful and i had to have massive bollocks to pull this thing out because of <laughs> this freaking shining force match where i stuck 12 for exact lethal oh yeah right 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 i mean um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was disrespectful. Uh, oh. You know, sometimes you gotta, you just gotta be, um, especially if you're, mate, you're playing a deck while your win condition is a level two. Okay. Oh like, yeah, I understand. I, I I fully get that. I mean, Kanan as well. The win condition is a level two. Um, it does have heals, but your win con is level two. I'm all about it. Um, and for the for the for the Kumas um listening to the podcast right now, uh. Yeah, so back back in the good old days, the only level threes that you had were bodyguards, and they didn't they didn't win you the game. You won the game on level twos. Um, yep. So I it, it was cool to see. Uh, it was a situation where like I can't remember in the shining game if you like it, yeah you you just didn't your opponent didn't get a chance to play because you just you just flipped it like you were just way luckier than he was Pretty much. at certain parts of the game and i know ken knew like sort of a little bit better what was going on but because i didn't know like he'd actually looked at your deck list um, so i think he sort of understood what was going a bit more i didn't i was seeing this stuff coming out live on the fly and what i was just seeing was someone who was just like oh okay um you know it's the equivalent of like I don't know, playing Hunter in like season one Hearthstone, which is me go face, me no oh. trade, like smoke, 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 smoke. And that's what you were doing, yeah, uh, pretty which much. is is funny. I, it's very, very funny. And um, I, I thought it was great to see someone who was just like, yeah, I, I understand my deck is objectively trash. Uh, I'm going to make the best of what I can. 
um, and uh, have a good time with it. And you hit a guy for 12 and just like yeah. cold stone, like picked up your cards and we're like, yep, okay, cool. That was it. Uh, definitely <laughs> intentional. Like very funny. I, I thought that was great. It was a great moment. Well, what's so good about that deck is like, it was intentionally built to grief zero. Nothing is good about that deck, buddy. Oh, no, it did exactly <laughs> what it was intended to do twice. What is it intended to do? Explain it's supposed this to, to me. wall off at level. T it's basically get those level two walls at level one, so the heal loopers don't have enough stock to do shit, because they're constantly playing cards out of their hand or paying out stock to get the shit they need because they lost it all by yeah because of big meat stick. Makes sense, man. I mean, it 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 like I said when I looked at it, I was like, no, nah, disrespectful. Um, I love it. I'm all about that. I mean, I. It, you know, I, I showed up to a to a serious event playing Black Rock Shooter once. So, you know, how would you do that to yourself? Other than the meme, dude, I came second. <laughs> That's fucking. <laughs> I'm starting to get a mental image of just like, yes, I can do this, and it's not going to matter because I'm better than these people. Whoa, okay. have an accurate description of your thought Whoa. process. You no, to no, do no, something no, that no, no, disrespectful. No, no. Whoa, no, 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 uh, uh... I, I don't know. Look, the game's changed now. I don't think I can do that sort of thing anymore. When I was in 20, 2011, 2012, yeah, I, you could show up with Blackrock Shooter and win an event. You can't. I, I wish I could show up with Blackrock Shooter and win an event now. Um, I reckon I could... I don't know, Ken. How far can I go with Blackrock Shooter? <laughs> uh, you, might be, you might win one game. <laughs> All right. It'd be a very <laughs> tough game. So this yeah. is why, like, when I when I talk about I'm going to meme a, uh, a win somewhere, it has to be with something that's semi-serious, um, like Kaleidoscope, which, you know, is a semi-serious deck that has now gotten a bunch of tools. And it's just that no one plays it and no one knows how to play it that I think I could sneak a win in somewhere uh, at right. some major. But, yeah, I mean, like, buddy, I would love... I've got maxed out Devil Survivor. I've got maxed out Canaan. I would love to win tournaments with these, but I'm not going to, right? Like, there's a limit no. to to the, how powerful the meme magic can be. And um, I I am a very, like, historically unlucky person. Um, I know everyone who plays card games says that. Um, I've, I've lost, like, poker mages on, uh, like, you know, people hitting, like, sub 1% um, uh, outs and things like that uh, multiple times. So, uh, look, the main magic has to be tempered somewhat. Um, I, I don't know. I probably have to get on, like, I'm the exact sort of person that someone like Ken doesn't want to play with them, like, on their team. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of person that Ken will be like, yeah, okay, we're going to go win Worlds. And, like, everyone's, like, practiced and, like, I've come up with what are the three best decks in the format ken what are the three best decks right now like if we we're going to go to worlds right now let's assume it was in japanese and we had three people on the team what decks would we play right now i guess kaguya data live uh I'd probably dare I'd become a god dare became god yeah well I, I don't think there's like three clear-cut best decks i just like gave two off the top that i recently played against Dare became god right. love live like Nijik masaki same for this is exactly what would happen right we'd we'd get we'd show up to the event and this is this has actually happened in a in a tournament that i have played in recently so keyforge nationals um that's a dead game uh but yeah so um yeah we'd show up we'd be all prepared ra -da 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 -da. player one shows up with data live player two shows up with whatever the second one you said kaguya summer and then i show up with the a godzilla trial deck right that's exactly the sort of dumb stuff that would happen and somehow we would still win as well and uh, and and I'd still end up with like a fifty percent win rate on some terrible deck, right? Not and, and not because I'm actually good at it, but because I'm like half drunk and uh, magically, you know, my opponents just play badly against me. I, I I don't know, like that's that's my competitive history in a nutshell. And then Ken would just be sitting there molding the whole time. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think okay. it, it, are Japanese events done in teams? Is that what is that what happens with them now, or are they still solo? No, they're, they're generally solo. Uh, the teams, oh, the okay, only teams well. events we get are Springfest and whatever unofficial event people want to be teams. Right. Well, if it's solo, then you guys don't have to deal with me, um, like ruining your odds. But you do have to deal with me, like somehow being at the bottom of the bracket for the entire day and still ending up in in in, in like top eight or something on 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 kaleidoscope. <laughs> <laughs> which 
mate. I do you not, Ken? Do you not believe in the kaleidoscope? Um, he doesn't believe. I he clearly. I don't doesn't. really. No, I think that like powerful finishes in this game are balanced by how easy it is and how easy it is to consistently pull off that uh, game plan every single time. So mm. I obviously like it, it's undeniable that yeah, if your opponent does kaleidos- kaleidoscope you when you're about to die, uh, it, it's pretty terrifying. But I also don't believe that it's as easy to pull off as every game as it is to bring, uh, use a slightly weaker finisher, but uh, a slightly weaker finisher, but that balances out by how easy it is to work out. For example, right. uh, the new Ilya finisher in the set, which I think um is something that I should address. Like I don't um I know your damage shot. Articles and stuff are pretty popular, but oh fuck! Yeah, I think I said this in the stream as well. I, I actually really don't like damage charts because most of the time people just look at them and say, "Oh, hey, this this finisher is better at killing my opponent than like this finisher, and therefore this is the better one." Like, yeah, it is better at killing your opponent, but like you can't um you can't. That's not how you use it. Give a value <laughs> for like how easy it is to pull off each one. And then like multiply like the kill potential with how like how consistent it is and then get a value, right? So like when people there was a time where someone told me it was like, oh um Mikasa from Attack on Titan is be- better at killing your opponent than uh Yukina from Bang Green, and therefore Attack on Titan is a better deck. And I was like that that like that that's not even a real comparison. <laughs> like the rest no, of the deck, I, the rest of the deck, is completely different stuff. So yeah, every time I just look at finish charts and what people are using them for, I'm just thinking like, the this should never be a starting point for like what deck you want to play, unless it's very clearly obvious that one's like weaker despite having roughly the same cost. Mm. Like you can tell yeah, that I mean, on attack burns are like generally stronger than restants and stuff, but yeah, I really don't like the application people use for those damage charts. Oh yeah, I've I've even had um I had someone tell me at some point that I was wrong about Puyo based on my own damage shot. Um which Incredible. was like which one of those moments where I'm going to be like you you, you kind of had to be like you, you know, you don't you don't want to be like do you know who I am? Um but I I kind of had to just be like you know I wrote that shit, right? Like <laughs> um yeah, this is definitely true. And it was something that I was worried about when I when we put the article out was that people were going to look at it and interpret it in the complete wrong way because I put triple kaleidoscope in there. And um, that was one a line that I wrote in there, which I think a lot of people, by the time they got to it, they were too exhausted from having read like 8,000 other words about children's card games, was that I specifically wrote triple kaleidoscope is not in here as a reasonable estimation. It's just to show like what the upper limit is, right? Because I think there's no denying, like no, I, and I, I, I objectively think this, no one can deny that Triple Kaleidoscope is the most powerful finisher that has ever been printed in this game. In terms of raw power, like if you land Triple Kaleidoscope, you win the game. Um, it's like twice as good as the next best finisher, even now. Like you just, the top end is just absurd. And this is taking out like... Um, like on and on any level of compression or whatever you want to call it, it is just full stop. Like burn nine individually, followed by three, three, three is it's just the best that you can get. The best a man can get. It's straight Gillette. Um, yeah. Do they have Gillette in Canada? Yes, we have okay. Procter and Gamble Incorporated <laughs> International, a Johnson and Johnson brand. <laughs> I don't know, dude. What, um, do you think we're like some backwater where they film Deliverance? Like. Like maybe I mean you guys have Quebec so uh, uh, moving on um, <laughs> I just ruined your audience uh, yeah but no so I already knew that triple class it's not it's not achievable right and no. even now I um, I can triple Kaleido on on the build that I'm on right now but it's so hard and it's 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 pure luck like I can't set it I can set up double but I can't set up a triple um, but people would come up to me and be like, oh, well, you know, like, Talover is better because X, Y, and Z, and it's better than Puyo because if you do it in this order and rah, 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 And, yeah, and it was an issue that, that that I thought would happen. The way that you use data is so important. And, I mean, it's not just in, in, in WISE, obviously. Like, it's just in, in life in general. Um, mm-hmm. uh, get vaccinated, kids. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we knew that we'd have issues with that. And the difficulty of setting up the combo is is or whatever the finisher is 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 so relevant and again it's part of the reason why when i look at some of this newer stuff 
it's just like oh i play a climax and like discard a card. i don't know what the condition is for data live right but it's, it's probably like play a climax and like pay one or like pay a, play a climax and discard a card or something right it's basically it's a non-condition discard. yeah it's a non-condition right uh, whereas you know to get the equivalent effect on some other sets you have to just leap through so many hoops um kaleidoscope i have always been behind just because i um i think the like the maths of drawing through your entire deck to set up this combo uh, first of all i find it very very fun to do um mm-hmm. even though it's not fun for your opponent because they're just sitting there watching you draw cards um and uh i think the maths has always been favored and it's always been an interesting interaction which is why it's one that i've always been around and it's one of those ones where it breaks the rule um which is part of the reason why i like i i love the meme is because it doesn't matter what the rest of your deck does as long as you set up the combo you win the game yeah, yeah. um it may as well be an exodia uh so uh even if you're like you can be two turns behind and you can still win on that deck as long as you can execute it properly which is cool and it, it breaks the rules of weiss quite a lot um it's not healthy for the game if it turns if it turns out that like you can actually make it good because i know no one's putting effort into figuring out these like niche old combos yeah. right in the same way that you don't see people using like old de capo stuff even though de capo is probably still playable i assume or like idol master is probably still playable or like re-zero is re-zero still playable re-zero uh, finally just re-zero. became not playable yeah. re-zero yeah, is in a can. Body. <laughs> well re-zero has had a new expansion last year so you don't really figure out the old stuff. You just kind of roll with the new ones for the most part. Yeah, right. And I mean, and probably a lot, a lot of the time, this wrong. sort of thing happens. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's a shame. I think when you see just like people just see the new the new combo. Like, I remember when Ilya's Y came out. I think, and they had the uh, like this was a point where I this is when I really solidified myself on the meme. I don't remember if it was like Ilya's Y or Ilya Dry or whatever it was, mm. but there was a an alternate finisher that came out for Ilya. Um, and it was the one that was like deal two, deal seven or something like that. Or deal seven, <laughs> deal two. Or deal two, deal five. I don't know. Um, uh, it's absurd. It's deal two, deal five in either deal, order. Deal two, deal five. Okay, right. And I, when I saw that, like I didn't even need to pull out the calculator. And I knew it was worse, right? In terms of what the actual upper limit of the damage is. I already knew it was worse. Um, but uh, the, the the thing was that I I, I just like people just immediately gravitated to that and i was left behind with my like with my kaleidoscope cards like sitting here like like a little gremlin um <laughs> under the bridge <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 exactly i went under the bridge as the troll that i am and you're and, sitting and there with there. the jojo ad yeah ex- exactly i was next to the jojo ad um in in, in akihabara um uh, uh you know and it, it's always a shame to me when like things just get totally written over um so yeah look yeah finish your charts are um, to to circle back to the original point, yeah, finisher charts are, are really bad if you use them in, incorrectly. I mean, they're an interesting theoretical piece, um, but and I mean, even the ones that I have written, I the, the, like you, you got to be careful on that stuff. Like oh, you really course. do. Otherwise, you just end up you end up with like one of those people who thinks that Marika is like busted when it's not. Uh, it was really good. It was really really good, but it wasn't busted. It wasn't even top three. Mm-hmm. Um, but the deck was because the deck had um the oh my god what's the character's name the three two blue ken do the thing uh what's its name three Kosaki? two blue search is a card huh yeah Kosaki. Or, or not oh, Kosaki. That card yeah you had the free fresh you had the early play that searched you had um the the marika level one combos you had marika at level three you had cancel burns you had heals you had uh, everything but the kitchen sink came with soy sauce if you wanted it like it was just a, f- a fantastic deck that's why the deck was good it was yeah. not because marika was like the best finisher that we'd ever seen no it was she was there. the cherry on top of this very yes. strong well-built yes, sundae yes, yes. the bananas are firm the ice cream is cold and the maraschino <laughs> the is right on top <laughs> An interesting way of putting it but yeah all right my guy wow i had yeah. to go with it Whew. like once Canadian you realize you uh, we have hockey <laughs> podcasts for fun. What do you expect? But hey man, uh, I, I respect that. Shit, I don't even. I respect it a little bit. A little bit, not much. <laughs> it's all good. Well, I think one of the things that I see about damage charts and uh, 
like being a professional economist, uh, like statistics is my my main background, right? Cool. And yeah. uh, one of the things that I see people, this is a very, very common error with anything to do with probability. I think people don't intuitively appreciate the difference between ex ante and ex post. Yep. Ex ante, you have to you the information that's available to you and process through the information set. Ex post, you can't see say what you saw happened and then reason back to your decision because your information set's different. And I think yeah. that's the key mistake that people are making when they take these damage tables that are either calculated through frequent a frequentist method where you just saw it happen a bunch of times or a Bayesian method through the neural nets. Yeah. You can't do that in a game state because you are in a different situation. Your probability distribution is based on your current deck, not an observed averaging of deck states. Yeah, and I mean, I can look at my opponent's deck and and be like, okay, I know you've refreshed with X amount and you have like seven climaxes left and you have roughly 20, 25 cards. Therefore, I know from my memorized damage chart that I have approximately this percentage chance to win, right? You can you can do that. Um, but, you know, there's there's so many other factors that you have to go through to get to that point that almost um, unless you can get to that specific situation like unless you have the kill shot and you're at the point where you have the kill shot it means nothing exactly. it really does mean nothing yeah like i compare this game's way of approaching like statistics and probability to mahjong quite a bit but like the best mahjong players know what uh generally what the better tile is to discard into mm. like what gives them the better odds, but they won't actually know like what exactly the percentage is, yep. and like that, that's generally just how you should uh, approach this game. You should know what the better choice options are, but you should, like it shouldn't be through like these pure numbers. And you know, um, it's very unusual that you would have a like even if you knew the numbers, you wouldn't say like, oh, if I could do this now, it's like seventy percent chance that I'll succeed. But if I do it next turn, it will be like whatever person because you have yeah. no idea what your deck states will be by the next turn so yeah, yeah. it's um it, it, like knowing these numbers is nice but the, you won't really be able to apply them like for what they are during games i believe well, the other thing is you're probably going to misremember them too yeah it's a fucking huge chart and yeah. <laughs> it's why i always like to liken why schwartz to risk management and finance mm -hmm. You have, sure, you can maximize your expected value, but if you if you break a certain barrier, you're dead. So you have to shore that fucker up, and it doesn't matter what the expected value play is sometimes. You, you mm -hmm. kind of have a feeling for it. You know what will break your barrier. Yeah. So yeah. Going back uh, to the tournament, was it oh, really no, no, fun no. to commentate? Oh, it's fucking great. Good. Yeah, um, it was fantastic. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. It was quite different to when I did the official one uh, for Springfest Online in that uh, I was a bit more free to kind of go uh, somewhat off topic. Uh, I could tell a few jokes. I was Dude, allowed... We talked about um, VTubers for half an hour. Yeah, I talked about VTubers for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, I was also able to... Uh, when I was commentating for the Bush Road event, uh, I was asked to avoid using terms such as uh, bomb and suicide because of the negative connotations that <laughs> those words obviously have. But uh, when I was commentating with uh, this event, I was I think I used bomb quite a bit instead yep. of reverser. Um, I, I, I don't like using the other word, but mm. oh, yeah, I, I was allowed to slip up a bit more and that definitely gave it much more like relaxed kind of atmosphere and yeah it was pretty fun i literally so um whenever i have done this is more of a chill thing this isn't like a paid um a podcast or anything yeah. um i uh whenever i've done podcasts or other uh commentary for other events and stuff my um my man <laughs> my old uh well, manager my co the guy who worked with me um we actually had uh, a uh, a no libel clause for like things that I could say just because it 
like if I worked in the bush, I could never work as a commentator for Bushy Road, like or do any work with Bushy mm-hmm. Road, like what Ken does, because it just doesn't suit my style at all. Um, I, I can't, I can't do that. Um, that that really measured, like like far more intellectual um, commentary than than what I do, which is which is it's slapstick, right? Let's 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 be real, okay? I'm not adding any uh, serious intellectual debate when it comes to a Weiss um, tournament. So doing it with SBTCG where it was pretty much, yeah, you have free reign to just like say whatever the hell you want and have a good time, talk to chat, like engage, and especially working with Ken, who is significantly more measured and far more professional than I am in those situations. Um, it, It was a really great balance. I think we bounce off each other really well um even though i tend to do like a lot more of the talking he brings in like the 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 30 percent versus the 70 percent that i say the 30 percent that he brings in is so impactful um and and so relevant to to what's actually happening um that it makes the waffling that i'm going on to fill space sound much better so can can really you know carried me as much as it might seem the other way around ken absolutely carried me through that um and it was it was great to work with him thank you very much well you guys made a fantastic team and even uh listening back to some of the matches that i didn't watch or even listening back to my matches it was a it was a very pleasant listening experience so i'm really glad that you two were the team to do it no thank you very much for that Mm -hmm. well i mean if you guys weren't good i wouldn't have invited you on my show (laughs) this is the premier watch sports podcast How many like sports <laughs> podcasts are there? Like, I guess there's UA's review show. If that counts oh, as a okay. podcast, yeah, I guess. They yeah. do read out the text, so you don't have to watch the screen to follow, I suppose. Yeah. There just really isn't a lot of like Weiss content is it seems like it's almost exclusively on YouTube nowadays or Twitch. What happened to the good old days of just writing a a, a three thousand word shit post on top tier tiers or um or, or or doing a Weiss round table or make Mark a great or whatever they, what was the there was another one um Weiss tea time Shout Weiss tea time Miles. still exists um, tea time still exists yeah, yeah the good old it, days it, of Paya does well, a lot of the writing for that, that's that, that those those were truly the good old days wouldn't weren't they I'm trying to bring it back I wrote an article about titties about sorry what <laughs> about yeah I wrote an article about tits on Weiss cards once oh. for the shit posting. <laughs> nice uh i pissed someone off on reddit is the wise reddit active like i i see people post on there but i have no idea who it's it's very weird it is kind of weird but i got called a misogynist because uh, i didn't give the type i didn't give the article adequate quick care for such a thing and they thought that they could write it better i told them to write that they should do it never did So uh, to Reddit user whose username I forget, write that titty article. <laughs> well, I, I think the most interesting one is uh, there's a card in Mushoku Tensei, the guild girl. I don't know if it's zoomed out enough, but that character has three breasts. So, oh, shit. Yeah, I'm going to go full out. total recal. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking this up right now. <laughs> well, it's like, actually, uh, Philip, I'm not sure how much you pay attention to certain releases, but are you aware of the Sneaker Bunko release? Um Oh man, hold on. Let me let me scroll. Let me find this. Uh I've got like what, the three I, titty I have... chick or the Sneaker Bunko? Sneaker Bunko is fucking wild. Okay. I've got I've you, got You can't play up. a door climax in that set without having a sex scene. Oh, oh yo, this is um Daniel Daniel Lee. Was was this D Lee that <laughs> Yeah yeah bro, I think was it D Lee? I think yeah, he would okay. have it. Yeah, okay. D Lee, um, I love you, bro, but you're a fucking degenerate, man. <laughs> like Yeah, no, I, I remember looking Oh yeah, no oh god, no, 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 no. Oh god. Yeah, uh, no. I didn't even realize that uh one of those scenes was from Redo the Healer. And uh, Yeah, yeah, it's the, the red it's like, what's uncommon. A- yeah, once I realized that, I was like, oh, oh, that's bad. It's and then there's like very- another card that's like actually just straight up artistic nudity. So it's like, yeah, there's you you can't actually play this this deck on stream. And uh, we had a guy <laughs> at locals who played the deck 
and he he like always wanted to be. I want to be on stream, guys. We're like, no, Daddy Bezos is gonna nuke us. So <laughs> he put it in his sleeve, and then he he put a whiteout t shirt over, oh, over her, just so he could <laughs> just play it on stream. Yeah, you know, this I is ha- something I I uh, I might get on my soapbox very very briefly here. This is one thing that I I'm constantly disappointed about by this game and i understand that it's a cultural thing right i understand that some of this stuff is appropriate in in japan um whereas we don't necessarily see it as appropriate uh in 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 the in the western or or outside of japan but more specifically in, in the western world um with that said like i would really really appreciate it if i could go to a tournament and play a full tournament without having to sit in front of someone who's using titty sleeves or like a mat that has like some degenerate image on it just every single game because it's it's genuinely straight it's very weird <laughs> like i don't want to i don't want to yuck anyone's yum which i kind of am like but bro the, it, some of the sets in this game like even to love Roo, like i felt uncomfortable playing that set. to, to love Roo is definitely higher up though it's yeah like up. it's a little it, sad that it's tame now uh, yeah, I, I, I genuinely <laughs> felt uncomfortable playing, um, playing that set. And like, I'd be at home, like play testing and like, you know, my, you know, my, I was living with my parents at the time and, and my mother would like walk past and just be like, is this like, is, is this part of your job right now? And I'd be like, well, this one isn't. And she'd just be like, spend more time on the other ones. Like <laughs> the ones with the, the meat hooks going through people's heads or whatever art appears in Magic the Gathering. Or She's like, go, go, go play the other one. Like you know there'd be times where i'd be sitting there with some of these cards and i just feel like yeah this is like this genuinely makes me uncomfortable at times and there was there were times where i've i've tried to bring people into the game who have been into anime girls in particular who've been into mm-hmm. anime who really wanted to play the game and i think that was, i had a friend who really liked um clanad which i had right. never i'd never watched but she really wanted to play and she was like okay fine i said we'll come to this locals and 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 play and have a good time and the first person that she sat across from had um like the like mysterious white liquid over sleeves um and and she never played again and um you, you know if if i understand that for some people it's just like oh this is this is sort of my thing and i i enjoy doing it some of some of this shit, like some of you guys need to chill. <laughs> like, it's and I know I'm speaking to the one percent, right? Mm-hmm. I get it, but like, oh man, some of that stuff is just. I don't want to sit down across across from. I, I think no, I I remember it was the um. It's the rabbit, the rabbit set. Oh, I, Gochi Yusa. Yeah, right. Gochi it was Yusa? that one, like with all the little kids in it, and then they yeah, had yeah, like yeah. the mysterious white liquid sleeves on top of it. And I was just like, man, this gross. is a little bit. That's it's a little bit. That's across the line. And um, yeah, yeah, I was just like, this is really, really strange. Like, I, I, I get that some of the artwork is weird. Like, no game, no life came out, and I remember someone sending me like one of the foils, and I was just like, yeah, that's a ten year old with no clothes on. Like, that's, yeah. like that's that's kind of fucked up. Um, well, it's like. They couldn't legally sell that shit in Canada, right? Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the way that Canada our bit... indecency laws work is that lolly is considered child porn straight up. Okay, good. Yeah. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. If that didn't change, they couldn't sell it straight up. Yeah, I, I some of those like there are there are moments where I look at this game like in the bunko sets because I think there's there's more than one. Like I just. I, I've walked past, like I've been to card stores, of course, plenty of times where I haven't been playing Weiss, and I just walk past Weiss and like Vince, who ended up coming, um, uh, placing really well on that. So I think he came, he came third overall. Um, yeah, he beat yeah, he me for third. third. Yeah, right. So like Vince and I, obviously, we we go way back. We know each other really well. Um, I I will walk past the Weiss every once in a while, and I'll just see some of the things that are there, and I'll just go, yeah, okay, cool, yeah, I, I I want nothing to do with this. Um, and that that really turned me off for. For quite a long time even even Ilya, um i again i've never watched the source material i don't care <laughs> but Ilya has some cards that are, are pretty sketchy um yeah the source and, material is very sketchy <laughs> yeah i have no doubt and you know 
on the one hand, the mechanic is so much fun. I really want to play it. I love to take it to games. I love playing it. On the other hand, I want nothing more than uh, to have my personal image as far away as possible from <laughs> all of the pictures that are on the cardboard. Have it's... you considered giving the cardboard sweaters? Dude, I would if I was allowed to mark the cards. I would. <laughs> I, 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 and I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If I could just play blank pieces of cardboard, or if I could play test images, I would use them over uh, the artwork in Ilya because I think a lot of it is just um, de de degenerate. Anyway, sorry. That's that's about all I wanted to say on that. Because no, uh, that's it, perfectly fair, and it's. <laughs> I, I know it's, it's well. It's like I know in public. I. I think I equivocate that on this too much. No, that shit's fucking weird. Yeah, I mean, look, and I understand, again, I understand, like, for some people, this is a thing that they're, they're into, and, like, some of these shows have an inherent amount of sexuality, and we can all be adults about it. I get that. Um, I I just, you know, I have to be in a room for, like, eight hours playing this game, uh, or whatever, however long a tournament is, and, like, having to sit across from... It's it, Mostly what it is is, like, I can, I can get past, like, the set that you're playing happens to have this artwork, but you want to play that set, fine. It's just the sleeves, man. Like the sleeves really get to me, and you know, playmats oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> Plus, yeah, sleeves and playmats. Yeah, yeah. Like, man, I use dra like I was sponsored by Dragon Shield for six years, so right. I I use exclusively Dragon Shield. I'm no longer sponsored by them, so I don't need to tout their products or anything. But you know, it's just clean, right? It's just simple. <laughs> it's all I ever needed, man. Um, and then I'd like sit down across from someone, and and they're like, oh, okay, uh, yeah. So here's uh like you know, untitled titty sleeve number 586. And I'm like, all right, well, whew, this is like, this is a man of culture <laughs> that yeah. I'm playing with right now. It's I like, don't know. It's, it's no, it's like, I, and it's kind of this weird thing where I, this is where I actually, I don't get things up. In, in my experience with a lot of uh, anime fans, they tend to be very socialist left wing leaning <laughs> until you get to this particular issue then all of a sudden they're in my libertarian part of the board and i'm like <laughs> wait i'd rather you be here for no taxes and all guns not this what the <laughs> fuck well, it's like all i don't right. understand it's like all of a sudden fine they... as long as the like dressed and posed. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, normally. I own that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Rounding out this podcast. Holy shit, we've been going for two out, two and a half hours. Uh, Easy. For a player just starting white shorts in 2021, what advice do you have other than keep it decent? <laughs> I mean, you play Ken, so this is this is on you. I think. Well, I said this one as well, but uh, because the game kind of just accommodates for both casual and competitive players at the beginning, you don't really have to like gear yourself towards one. You can just get into the game and learn it. But uh, if there is one thing, I guess don't get too annoyed over what uh, seem like the random elements of the game. Uh, it it won't help you if you want if you want to be competitive. If you're casual, it's just like subtracts from how much fun you're having so mm. yeah i'd say just uh you know try and keep your like, keep your calm uh if you get unlucky you're unlucky and that's that try and move on right like embrace the random yeah embrace the random and you'll probably just enjoy your time a lot more um okay what would i say on this i would say no matter what someone like me who is always going to be turbo competitive and cares nothing really either for, for casual play i think like i'll forever defend your right to be a complete casual um and i think you should enjoy the game however you want to enjoy it and don't let the don't let yourself be convinced by someone like me who's been playing for a long time who has like very competitive outlook on 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 games in general um enjoy the game in the way that you want to enjoy it um but with that said, don't ever stop trying to be better. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you don't want to be competitive, you can always be better. I, I can always be better. Um, and 
you will you will genuinely enjoy any pastime that you do, whether it is I don't know playing an instrument or exercising or playing a card game. If you try to make yourself a little bit better every time that you play, you will enjoy the game more, um, mm. and you will learn more. And going forward, when you continue to play the game, um, you will find new and more interesting ways to enjoy the game. And I think just the, the greatest example of this is, you know, I can, in, in, in having having now played card games professionally for over a decade, well, geez, actually a, a decade and a half. Oh, sure. um, yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> um, I I can find enjoyment in certain parts of the game that casual players will never find because I could just say to myself today, I like my goal is to win with something stupid, something completely stupid and, and throw it together on a whim at six o'clock in the morning and rock up to an event and just have a good time with it. Um, Mm. and you know, if you don't need to be, you don't don't need to be that you don't don't need to be aiming for the world championships, right? Just, you don't want to be the guys at the bottom table every week and and you will find so much more enjoyment because winning is fun right but winning and knowing that you're doing the best that you can um uh, that that you can is is even more fun so don't don't stop trying to be better um no matter how new you are no matter what your background is um you can be better as well that's the other thing as well and if you are someone who's coming into a game wanting to be competitive don't let your lack of experience stop you and Riaz who went on to win two world championships is the greatest example of this when he started playing the game he was trash he was a really shit player um and I'm sure he would agree that he was he was very bad um he became a two-time world champion just from practicing from wanting to be better um Mm -hmm. and I doubt he would describe himself as like one of these like turbo neckbeards who is trying to be the best of the game um, I think he would describe himself as someone who is playing for the fun of it, who happened to just get really good because he tried. So that is always there for you. So for the casuals and the competitors, there is someone, there is something there for you. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, just follow your heart with it and you, you'll get somewhere. And who knows, maybe you'll, uh, you'll turn it into a career. Um, probably not through Weiss, uh, but <laughs> like, like through magic, through Pokemon, through Yu-Gi-Oh for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Poker. 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 Yeah. <laughs> we have poker WPT. Yeah. Honestly, that's fantastic advice from both of you. Uh, really loved it. And that's all the big burning questions I and the Calgary Weiss Schwartz community have for you. Before we go, though, I'd like to see if you guys are down for a game of Rapid Fire. For those who don't listen to old Fox hockey podcasts, Rapid Fire is a segment that Jay Onright and Dan O'Toole did on their Fox Sports show back in like 2004. Jay and Dan. They would ask a series of lighter, silly questions in quick succession, most of them yes or no. Or a quick one, one or two word answer. When they went back to Canada's sports network, TSN, they left the segment behind. My buddy decided to take it from them, and I'm stealing it from him. Are you guys down? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure thing. All right, let's go. Better meta, English or Japanese? Japanese. Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> Best place for food after weeklies in Sydney, Australia? Uh, my house. Uh, I guess I'll say Sunflower. It's a... It's a Taiwanese. I think it's a it's a Taiwanese uh, food place. Oh, that's they have awesome. some pretty good deals on their tea. Nice. I've got four hundred bottles of wine. <laughs> Do you just get like blackout? <laughs> yes. Damn. Uh, best thing to do in Sydney that is not a tourist trap. Uh, right now. Aside <laughs> from playing the wine tourist series. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Generally, <laughs> um, I would say, um, honestly, going checking out small bars, um, small cocktail bars mm. is fantastic. Mm. Uh, this one's not a year round thing, but we have this big anime convention called Smash. So, if you're ever around at that time, I guess that's a cool thing to check out. Okay, do the kids these days lack character because they have it too easy with their consistent decks, two good red triggers, and every possible archetype in their first set yes uh not a hard yes but i think well i think it comes from other parts it's um stuff like easy level one climax combos finishes that uh 
more committed to finishing the game than having a backup plan, stuff like that. So yeah, for different reasons, but yes. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go full Jotaro here, just because I have to make one anime reference throughout this entire podcast to pretend as if I'm part of the community. It's mm. just a yes, yes, yes. Okay. And then I'm actually going to break kayfabe here for people who watch uh, soap operas for men that's wrestling. This last question, Philip actually asked me about before we recorded, so him saying he didn't read the questions is a total lie. Does Kilua deserve the flaming he gets? Oh, bro, I, I skimmed that shit, man. Like, <laughs> I don't actually know exactly how much flaming he gets, so... Um... Everyone deserves the flaming. Doesn't matter who you are. If you get flamed, you always deserve that. Oh, wow. <laughs> are are yeah, you man. on the big back, bring back bullying train by any chance? <laughs> I mean, I'm on the bring back, like, talk mad shit, like, okay. you know, equal, equal rights, equal lefts, um, no, I train of just, no, I love mad. Banter is good, right? Banter hmm. makes every community. If you can't have some bants, then, uh, uh, then, yeah, you're, uh, um, then, then your community sucks. No, I did yeah. not read, I did not read all the questions. Um, I tried <laughs> to open your, your thing and my phone, because I am, I, I basically have a flip phone. I have an iPhone four. Um, my what? yeah, yeah, I know. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, how is it still alive? I want to know. That's impressive. <laughs> and it, it it didn't open the document properly, and I got like the bottom paragraph and a half. So yeah. I yeah, that's that's all I got to see. Yeah, that's really weird because I I just sent like a word document, dude. Like, yeah, no, I kidding. thought you could open them because that's apparently the only way you know to write how to write up a deck list. I'm the, I'm the high <laughs> tech <Yeah>. man. <laughs> okay, that's that's Use that's a good burn. I'll pay that. <laughs> My, um, come on, Microsoft Excel has existed for as long as Word has. Or as if you would write a deck list in Excel, what sort of like? No, uh, no, 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 no. That's it that's does your ratios like for you. Shit. Yeah, like, well, you can't add to fifty. So you're a statistician. Uh, I don't want to add to 50. <laughs> I, I only have so many toes. Talking shit that I, that I write my deck lists in Microsoft Word. Bro, you got, how many fingers do you have? You got 10. Multiply that by 5. You got it, buddy. That means I could only play 10 cards. Well, in regards to the question, I, I don't know exactly how much flack um, Kilo gets, but I think as long as you create content, there's always going to be people out there who don't like what you're saying, so... Uh, you know, the fact that you have I haters that. Just means that you're making good stuff. So I'd say keep it up. Awesome. Yeah, so that wraps us up for today. Uh, thank you again for giving me almost three hours of your time at midday in Australia. No problem. <laughs> it's all good, man. Yeah, I think we've actually recorded something really mm -hmm. awesome here. If you like what you heard in this interview, make sure to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. Search Wow Wow Weiss. You'll find our previous interviews with Anime Evo champion and SBTCG team member Kilua, who apparently is doing good stuff per Ken, and owner of SBTCG and former world champion Yue Peng, along with a bunch of other thoughtful Weiss discussion from the Calgary community. If you want to check out our written work, head on over to wildwildweiss.wordpress.com. See, the written word is not dead. Our video material is on YouTube. Search Wild Wild Weiss. Follow us on Twitter at Wild Wild Weiss or check out the Calgary Weiss Schwartz community on Facebook or Discord. I've done my plugs. What do you guys want to push? Um, okay. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much to, uh, um, to Calgary um, for, for hosting us, I guess. And uh, thank you very much to Tim um, for having us on the show. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to, uh, just give a quick shout out to, um, the UA at SBTCG again, um, Dan's Ranch, um, the guys around the 2011, uh, sorry, the 2012 Legacy Weiss event. Um, shout outs to Global, uh, shout, shout outs to, to Foring, um, any of the remnants from there, um, who moved over, um, Yabaka, um, Miles, uh, Alfred, um, yeah, just the old guard. Um, miss you guys a lot. Hopefully, we'll we'll be able to get back together again and and, and do some shit. And um, Corey Michael, um, huge shout outs to Corey. Uh, Corey and I will be partnering on a uh, business venture, bringing a um, uh, yet another Y Schwartz store um, back alive um, soon. So you guys will hopefully see that. 
um, and you'll see that around. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I think that's that, that's kind of all from me. I will be um, I, I won't be around a lot um, creating content, but you guys know where to find me. So you'll 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 see me on uh, on Facebook and whatnot. And uh, when I'm there, I'll be there. So uh, that's I think that's about all. I don't have a Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, but uh, you guys know where to find me. Do we? I think we're Facebook friends. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll post on a on a certain defunct blog um, once. Once. Uh, the Did we have something to do with uh, a certain hat? Uh, wait, what? Make Marika great again. Hat. Oh, hat. oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Do not get that. What? <laughs> I didn't. I had no idea what the hell you were talking. I thought you were talking about MMG, but I didn't know what the hell you were talking. No, about. I'm talking about the goddamn Trump hat. Oh, right, 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 right. I yeah, I actually have one. Um, oh damn. I need a. I need a. I, I was gonna like get someone to stitch like a like a patch of Marika's face onto it. And I never managed to find a good patch. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, for me. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tim, for uh, having having us on, as well as uh, UA Strictly Broken TCG's team and Dan's Ranch for hosting the tournament the other day. Had quite a bit of fun. Uh, shout outs to uh, WCC, my team, and Team TXC, uh, Team TXC TCG, where I'm also making content recently on YouTube. Uh, we're trying to do something at least every fortnight, but uh, it just kind of depends on what our schedule is. Um, we might do one of those. Uh, commentated guest match streams again so if that interests you please come along uh, otherwise uh, yeah you can find me on discord at zabuton hash, uh, hashtag hey, uh, 8605 or on twitter at zabuton78 uh, i am generally pretty open to questions as long as you say hi uh, sorry i don't sometimes i don't talk to strangers if you don't if i don't know who the hell you are and stop being rude to me but yeah aside from that uh just <laughs> yeah yeah sorry <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's really unique to you. Uh, well, sorry. I, I was uh, I was um asking questions about an anime I had on Twitter the other day, and some complete random I've never he heard about just came up to me and started talking to me. So, yeah, if you're that guy, for some reason you found this podcast, yeah, I did ignore you. <laughs> and it's stone cold. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyhow, uh, I think that's about it. So, yeah, thanks again, and uh, that's it from me. Don't message Ooh. me on Discord. I won't read it. I dead ass won't. <laughs> yeah, Kilo actually warned me about that. <laughs> yeah, just no. Don't message me on Discord. If you guys manage to find my Discord, don't. Just don't. Just just message me on Facebook. All comers, you guys, you you can come chat shit to me and send me hate photos or whatever. That's fine. Damn, that's powerful. Oh, also for the North Americans listening, a fortnight is a period of two weeks. Wait, Wait, is it, are you Wait, serious? Is, is that I a word you guys don't use? Yeah, no. Wow. Yeah, I used to live in the UK, so that's why I know what the hell it is. I did wow. Know. That's uh yeah, we're very cultured um down in this little convict nation, which <laughs> neither can I actually can can were you born in Australia? Yeah, I'm born here. My parents no, I fucking I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> on, on. Yeah, I am born in Shout out to France. <laughs> Oh, to France. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, sorry, I should probably uh, uh, shout outs to uh, my god sister Elaine, who just got her fourth PhD. Much love. Fourth doctorate, damn. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks, thanks you guys for uh, giving such a great interview. It was a ton of fun. Until next time, this has been Tim Jensey. See you guys later. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> and I hope to see y'all next time. And we're out. Bye. Peace. <laughs>